And as I conclude, one of the some of the ways that we do this as, as Microsoft, we are able to work with you, um, especially if you're already if, if you're already engaging with us or even not, and you want to go through this path, we we get remote deployment help with fast track. Fast track is what is an investment we make to our customers to ensure that you're using the most of um, of the resources that you have, of what you've bought, of the acquisitions that you have. So we work with you. Fast track is also one of the ways we work to our partners. We understand that as Microsoft, while we we are a large multinational in term, in order to be deep in the countries and in the markets that we operate, we understand that we have to work with local partners. So our partner network is massive. It is extensive. So that partners that you see, they are well trained, they come well backed up, well skilled, um, very confident, and they work with you. They know what to do. We invest in them as well. We invest in you, and there are ways and there is resources we are built around so that we are present somehow, whether directly or indirectly. Then there's the self service deployment guidance, and the self service de deployment guidance, this again, it means there's a flow that you can follow, which is very straightforward which is easy, which can be done. And we we can also assist you remotely. We have teams that sit remotely to assist. As I say, mine is not to keep you for too long. It's just to show you the summary of this, helping you beyond securing the remote work. So once you've figured your remote work, where you support your team in your new reality, then you start to think about what next you, what next you need to do. Then you, stop, you can work with us to stop attacks with automation and AI. So artificial intelligence becomes very big, especially in terms of catching malware or stopping ransomware in your environment, where you modernize your security operations, where you strengthen your cross-cloud security posture, where you mitigate insider risk. risk. This, again, you look at them after you've done all the, the three phases, then we become very heavy on security because it means you've allowed quite a bit to be remote, quite a bit to be digital. And I am done, unless you have any questions, so I don't start in the way of your new place. To businesses, it's about improving efficiency. At Ansoft, it's about bringing the future to business, helping businesses get a little smarter every day. With a keen focus on government, SACOs and the private sector, Ansoft Technologies is a leading enterprise ICT solutions provider specializing in Enterprise resource planning solutions including human resources and payroll systems, SACO management systems, agency and mobile banking solutions, customer relationship management solutions, electronic document management systems, and e-board solutions. We've built our offerings around our customers' needs, aligning ICT with business strategy and goals, helping to reduce your costs and free up your time. There's a reason why over 50 partners have consistently voted for us with their businesses over the years. We make great partners, and great partners make great solutions. Ensoft, for all your ICT solutions. All right, please, another round of applause for Kendi Derito, Country Manager, Microsoft Kenya, giving us our insights on securing today's remote working environment. Well, as I'd mentioned to you, we have partners and friends who've made this symposium possible. It is day two, and all of them has been very kind enough, and that is Little Cub. And in, just in case you'd like to use taxi services in the course of the day, they are giving us a promo that you can use if you'd like to utilize the, uh, their cabs in the course of the day. All you need to do is use their promo code, which is little C I O, and you'll get almost, I think it's 50% of the uh, value of that ride to wherever you'll be going or coming back to the hotel. Right now, I'd like to welcome George Njuguna. He's the CIO at Safaricom, and he will be delving onto matters moving fast without breaking things. An ambiguous topic, but I'm sure very important in this conversation we're having. George Karib Sana. Thank you. Makofi, it's, it's okay. You can... Good morning. I trust you're all well. Everybody had a nice evening. Uh, nice fireside with uh, Mr. Kahawa. Uh, Mr. Kahawa did not make it, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure he'll show up sometime. 
So a, a very interesting topic. I think uh, maybe it derives a bit from, sometimes I say that if you don't give engineers anything to build, they'll automatically break things. So I really like this topic. Uh, I'm not saying that our engineers break things, <laughs> uh, but I just want to share experiences. Uh, I'm not selling perfection, but hopefully if we can share experiences and talk about some of the things we've learned, hopefully we can build a better and more perfect uh, digital and IT, not just organizations, but actually country. So when I was looking at this topic, uh, what caught me of interest is when you talk about you're, you're building things you don't want to break uh, and you're moving fast, you really have to ask yourself what really is at stake? What are we talking about here? And when I look at it from our organization's perspective, just a few numbers that I always like to remind myself when we are thinking about it. We are talking about 42,000 uh, transactions per second on the SMS platform, voice about 12,000, about 36,000 on data, 2,000 uh, terabytes a day, and 1.5 billion transactions a month on M-Pesa. So you can just imagine what would go wrong is that we move fast and things begin to break. And at the heart of it, even beyond all of this, is actually a customer. It's somebody who's trying to send an SOS, SMS, somebody who's trying to uh, pay, sometimes even for a medical emergency, somebody who's trying to get transportation to see their loved one who maybe just has a few days to go, somebody who's trying to buy a wedding gift for a memorable occasion. And more so even, it could be a child who's trying to get a picture with their daddy who is likely maybe even serving overseas, capturing a moment. At the heart of it, the break is not about just technology. It's really the impact that ultimately it tends to have on people. And at the heart of our conversation today, and even with my team, those are some of the things that we are always thinking about. Last year, Safaricom, our new CEO, Peter Ndegwa, uh, launched a new vision of being a purpose-led company. But I, without touching on all the pillars, and I know mo many of you can look at this in our investor briefs, the key thing that I pick out really comes around the third line about deepening customer engagement and experience. Peter talks a lot about being customer obsessed. He says, yes, it's okay to have great services, it's okay to have great products, but at the heart of it, what are you thinking about the customer? And it comes so high even before we talk about our transform transformative pillars or enablers. So what does all this mean for a CIO? I think we want to it Oops, somebody else has joined me. So we are really balancing what I'd call polarities. Polarities is two things that you need to handle. Let me give you one. You're being told you need to cut costs, but you need to have better stability. You're being told you need to have, uh, uh, you need to rationalize uh, your resources, but at the same time, you're being told you need to have the best talent. So really, none of the things are bad, but you really are constantly balancing in a real world. I always uh, tell the team I work with uh, that's doing Ethiopia, I'm very happy about you guys because you're building from zero. Uh, for those of us who kind of you're in a growing concern, you're an organization that's running, these are some of the things you're dealing with. You're trying to scale and move very fast, but at the same time you need to maintain stability. There's increased complexity. Uh, if you think, we talked about moving from monolithic to microservices, and people think that that's easy. Wow. When I sit with the devs and they're telling me, George, pods are scaling and this, I'm like, wow, the monolith was a lot easier to understand than these things you're telling me about containers. And many of the times, there's limited automation in our environments. We find ourselves also, you need to be agile, a lot of releases per day. You need to give a lot of people access to systems. You're kind of devolving through the agile squads, allowing them to do a lot. But at the same time, you need to maintain stability, but the bigger S of security. Then you find barriers to adoption. Uh, these are in every organization. Uh, I'm sure even Safaricom, certainly, we're not immune to it. And I think the biggest barriers many of the times to the transformation and adoption of next generation technology is actually the mindset. 
uh, many times it's not the technology, but it's the thinking. It's how we've been ingrained, how we've been wired to work that actually stands in the way. Then as I said, you're being asked to optimize resources and, uh, and you are really trying to figure out how do you balance costs, lowering price for customers, consumers, and at the same time offering better and better value, everybody wanting something faster and better. So we embarked on a journey about three years ago. Uh, we talked about DevOps and being agile, and I'll talk a, a bit about it, uh, but luckily I'm here with Elizabeth and Alan, who actually live it. Elizabeth's our head of digital engineering. So the key things is we need to balance this flexibility and uh, having stability. So what does that look like? Traditionally, we ran these big waterfall projects before the end of the previous uh, financial year. You would actually step in, uh, say these are the 30, 50, 80, 100 projects. You get your budget. You set up project teams working with vendors to do it. Now it's a lot different. Right now you talk about what is the vision and the mission you want to achieve. We say we actually want to digitize X percent of our customer experiences. And you allow the team to come up with how they're going to do it. Traditionally, you'd be buying platforms and getting vendors to do this. Now people are building platforms in-house and being able to iterate and work on it in a way that drives and supports the consumers in what they're building. So these are the, the balances we have to do. We need to move fast, but at the same time, as we're moving fast, we actually need to make sure that what could break actually does not break because of what it would mean. So what does that look like in, in there's still tool sets that are extremely important. We spoke about the practices. But really, you need to de deploy fast. And one of the things we've learned in doing this is uh, gone are the days where every deployment is a situation where you, you get in, you have 100 engineers, you're having guys changing code, changing parameters. The fact is, and uh, any of you who've been devs, some things just don't work. If you're having a guy on the night of the change, is actually going there and is supposed to have changed some parameter, maybe to a zero or a one. Uh, okay, let me talk in real language, yes or no, for devs. And he just forgets a zero and a one. <laughs> you can imagine what happens. I'll give you a case we were <laughs> similar to this. We were about to do a very big launch, and I won't mention it, uh, what it is. And we had a situation where somebody forgot to just take one parameter. The next thing I'm seeing trending is that there's a heist going on. Genuine mistake. The guy has done this very many times. Had to figure out how we're going to close that gap and claw back billions of resources. Uh, because naturally, when people hear there is free data, everybody finds the news reaches them long before it even reaches some of us. And so we're really trying to remove the possibility of such issues happening by actually looking how we can automate deployments. And we've been able to be very successful in that. How can you then be able to roll back without having to go through an entire project to be able to do it? How do we get to do experiments? On the MPESA side, we're working on what we, we're calling canary deployments, where you do uh, blue-green. You actually can deploy a release to a subset of customers or a certain region. They get to test it, work on it. If you like it, you deploy it to everyone else. If you don't like it, you roll it back. Many customers have been complaining also about the downtimes that we have when we do large M-Pesa upgrades. I'm happy to tell you this last one was the longest, last long downtime that we'll have on M-Pesa. By adoption of the new technologies, our future deployments, even upgrades on M-Pesa, will require less than 15 minutes downtime from the four to 10 hours that it's been taking. We just can't afford to continue having our customers have a very long downtime because we are doing changes. And then really being able to put uh, what I call AI ops. Uh, when you run such a big operation, thousands of servers, 800 uh, people in IT, lots of moving parts, again, uh, calling 30 engineers onto a call to figure out why transactions are failing. You have your USSD team, your, what we call our SMSC team, the TIPCO integration teams, and you get on these calls and sometimes you can lose your mind and you're having a leadership call. We're really moving to AI ops. How can the system be actually able to tell us exactly where the problem is 
and not just tell us so we can fix it, but actually be able to fix and auto heal. And that's the direction I believe that we are headed in terms of technology. Now, how does all this uh, come together? I think there's two big things. So as Safaricom, we say, I am Safaricom, and I'm notoriously customer obsessed. So on one side, you're dealing customer obsession, and another side, you're dealing innovation. Uh, one may say that these are polarities, but in actual sense, I believe they all come together because you're innovating for the customer. But at the same time, you can't innovate and end up breaking things and say that you're customer obsessed. So how do you look at balancing it? I think it's always realizing that we don't do technology just for the sake of technology or products for the sake of it. We may have tons of marketing and product people. Are we actually doing things that are actually impacting the customer and are for the good of the customer? And really being able to hear back from the customer, having the customer in the center of the room in what we're building. And so I'll just invite Liz to talk a bit about uh, the tool chains that she does. Uh, so what we have, our digital engineering team, is really powering Agile. Uh, they not only help to bring in the developers, and I think in the last uh, X months, about 300 new developers have joined Safaricom, but also what they do is they build the tools, the pipelines, that enable all these squads to be able to work without always coming back to central and being able to continuously learn, iterate, and improve on what they're doing by also looking at Agile metrics. So I'll just have Liz uh, give us a brief on what she does, and then uh, Alan will come in and give another example, and then I'll close. Thank you, George. So I'll just pick up from where George left, and I think for us, everything that we do is driven on what the customer is saying. Looking at the current trends, customers more and more know what they want. So when we are building our solutions, we are looking at what is the feedback we are getting from our customers, what insights we are able to derive from the data on the transactions that these customers are doing, and then we iterate this through an innovating and an experimentation spree to just be able to see if we can work from an MVP and give the customer what they want continuously. So what we have done is, for us, we've built an engineering culture. We are coming more from uh, three years ago, relying a lot on partners to build software for us. But now going forward, we are saying we want to shift from buying to building ourselves. And so what we did, uh, number one, was just to build an engineering culture. And we look at it from the point of just looking from the people, the process, and the platforms that help us really accelerate our speed of delivery. But also in terms of ensuring that we deliver quality, and this quality is delivered really fast to our customers. So we, built, uh, we, we looked at uh, some modern uh, technologies that we are using and specifically leveraging on open source quite a lot. Since as you experiment, really open source helps you in terms of reduction for the cost, but also allows you to try a lot more tools at no cost and invest as and when you start getting value out of it. Uh, we, we adopted uh, DevOps as a way of um, working where we have really small cross-functional teams that are uh, driven, uh, working on an agile way of working. We adopted the Spotify, Tribe, Squad, and Chapter model, which is really helping us have small teams focused on a customer problem, iterate with the customer at the center through getting feedback, incorporating it, and working to build a solution for our customers. And just to move next in terms of DevOps, we adopted the DevOps way of working. This is where you have the team uh, both uh, developers and operations working together, they build and run the solution. So you start thinking about operations from the time of ideation. As you build your solution, you're making sure that you're putting everything that you need to put in to ensure that this software is going to run really well on production. And we also looked at the tool chain itself. This is the continuous integration, continuous delivery tools. Again, I said we leverage a lot on open source. However, there's enterprise tools that we've bought, yes. But uh, as we try and experiment these, we really try to make sure that we can, we can leverage on open source. I'll move to... Sorry about that. So what we, we are doing is, uh, at the moment, we have over 500 developers that are working on software for Safaricom. This is the consumer software, but also in, uh, software for enterprise that Cass, uh, Alan is going to be speaking about. And with these 500 developers working in about over 50 squads, 
There can be a lot of chaos in terms of people building continuously and deploying to production. Just spoke about the core systems that we have to really safeguard. And so when we are looking at when we are looking at this as well, we are looking at ensuring that besides us delivering really fast, we're also ensuring that our customers are kept secure, but also the quality of the software that we're delivering is top of class, and on top of that, that we don't break what is already existing. So at the moment, we are, we are having over 400 releases per month, and that's quite a number, looking at, at the number, looking at the core systems that we have that really need to be safeguarded. And uh, looking at these developers, so then we adopted uh, DevOps as a way of working. And we looked at a couple of things as well. For the platforms that we are using, we leveraged on specifically public cloud. And at the moment, we are deploying quite a bit of our, 78% of our digital channels are running on AWS public cloud. And this has really helped us in terms of being able to take away the cares and worries of the infrastructure from the developers and allow our developers to just focus on their core job, which is software development. We looked again a lot in terms of how do we secure our releases. And as part of our continuous integration, continuous delivery, we ensure that we can automatically scan and automatically test our software to just make sure that we take away the problem of all this testing, reduce the time it takes from the time software is built to the merging of packaging of the software and delivery of this software to production. Part of our key enablers has been really the transitioning from the monolithic, inf monolithic inf uh, de de deliveries or deployments to more of microservices delivery. And this allows for us, for the small teams to be able to work together, working on small features of the software, and allow these teams to be able to iterate really fast and be able to separate the concerns from the different features from each other and allow different teams to, to be able to work, work and collaborate together. But this really needed uh, quite a lot of um, work and thought in terms of how do these developers really work together? How do we collaborate? You have 20, 30 people working together on the same project. And this requires uh, uh, investment in terms of the software and also how do we, just making sure that all these people that are been building this software can be able to continuously integrate and this is a process for DevOps that has really been helpful for us. We looked at the tool chain that, that has really helped us, that is a continuous delivery tooling that allows these developers to work together, collaborate uh, every day uh, through the collaboration tools. But on top of that, making sure that all this code that they are uh, creating can be batched every day automatically. And a lot of that uh, ensuring that the shipping and the, pa the packaging and the shipping of this software is fully automated. We've really leveraged a lot on um, automated deliveries as well. This has helped us uh, in terms of removing the errors that we used to have from our configurations. When our devs used to do the work at night, sometimes we could make errors. And the automation has been helpful in terms of reducing these human errors. Another key thing for us has been a lot about also automating the infrastructure uh, provisioning. Pre this is something that we've done recently. Previously, we had the application um, delivery automated. And recently, we've looked at tools, especially because we are, leverage, we are leveraging on AWS. And the APIs that AWS provides us allows us to be able to automate that whole process of uh, uh, provisioning infrastructure. And currently, we've, uh, we've automated the whole flow from the time of building the code to the time the code is shipped into production. Another key thing for us that George had spoken about is about observability. Because then again, we have to be able to know what is happening on our software, our solutions before our customers complain. And we've leveraged a lot of tools that are there in the industry, uh, from Elasticsearch, Kibana, uh, Dynatrace, that is our key one at the moment that we're implementing. That way we're able to pick issues or performance issues in our systems before our customers can be able to pick that. We are looking at us, um, our desired outlook and where we want to be. I said we are really big on talent because we realize at the end of the day, we are saying we have to build. People are the ones to build the software, and we need to really build a, soft, a strong software engineering talent at the moment. And we are looking at making sure that everyone who is joining IT at the moment is actually a software engineer from a start. But we also have a lot of activities that we are doing in terms of building the talent, reskilling it, and upskilling the, the talent. The other thing is, I said we adopted the Spotify tribe squad and chapter model, and this means that you have very small cross-functional teams that work together every day on a specific customer solution, and we're looking at getting ourselves to 80% of our staff to actually be moved up into the tribes and 20% only to work in the COEs, the shareable infrastructure, the shareable systems, to allow for stability as well for these and maintenance of these core systems. Key thing for us is, I said we are big on cloud and we 
made sure that all the applications that we are building are fully cloud native, and this means they can run on any cloud. So we are ag uh, cloud agnostic. You can run on-prem, on AWS, on Azure, whatever cloud platform that is there. And then 80% of our software needs to be built by us. Of course, we are leveraging uh, an insourcing model where we have partners that work with us to build this uh, software, but as much as possible, maintain the IP with us. And one of the key benefits that we've seen is uh, previously when we really um, I, uh, working with the vendors and especially the, where the IP is not ours, you don't have the code, you can't automate the deployments, you don't have control over that code as well. And looking at the moment, customers every day want a change or want something new. So in terms of our ability to scale, this was really constraining for us. And so for us building the software, then we can change it as and, as and when the customer needs it. Some technical help. How did it work? Okay. So I'll give uh, two, we'll give two use cases of how DevOps has been really helpful for us at Safaricom. And we'll speak about the My Safaricom app. I really hope we all have it on our phones. And this was one of our first channels that we decided for sure we needed to build it ourselves and have full control of that app. And so far, we've we adopted fully everything that I've spoken about, the software engineering practices. It's fully inbuilt by the agile squads. And so far, we've seen great improvements in terms of the stability measures and the availability measures. This is one of the top, actually it is the top app at the moment in Kenya, if you look at the stats. And we've, uh, we've so far had 5.8 million downloads. It's, a, it's an app that we've really built in incorporating customer feedback looking at what the customers really wanted, and we keep to continue to iterate. We are not really 100% there. But then every day that we're getting feedback from these customers, we are taking it and trying to just making, making it better. At the moment, we have a 4.8 rating for uh, Apple, and I can tell you this is really a world-class score and something that we are really proud of. Looking at the scores that we had on the previous app that we had, which we'd really leverage the vendor to build it for us. And in terms of the releases as well, this is an app that is fully on cloud, fully automated, full DevOps chain. It has full automated uh, deployments, automated cloud provisioning. The, uh, it's on AWS. We are able to scale and scale up and down depending on the traffic that we are receiving from, from our customers. And I would, I would say again, in terms of our availability, it has been one of the apps really not problematic. It's been really always available for our customers. And we've seen very good, um, in terms of the crash rates, 98% is really good. Uh, uh, it's a really good metric considering the kind of phones that we have in this part of the market. So in terms of our success, I would say it's fully powered by DevOps, fully in build again. And it's everything fully automated. And it's something that we, continue, we will continuously build and continuously iterate on it. Alan? Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, I just take a minute. For enterprise, um, enterprise customers, we've also looked at uh, how we can be able to accelerate uh, because most businesses would be interested in the speed, uh, the control, um, in terms of controlling the journey, and uh, also the experience that they are, they are going to get out of our platform. So what we've done is, um, of course, the, nine, the last 19 months or so has been quite difficult for every, uh, every business as well as a customer. But we had to um, you know, change our approach in terms of how we get and build a talent that can be able to um, you know, move in quickly, work from everywhere in the world, and being able to use collaboration tools and uh, be able to develop much faster. How did we do this? We leveraged on um, um, you know, development tools that we have uh, across, uh, the way of working being Agile framework, and then um, use the tools to enable at least all our developers across the globe. We have about um, five countries where all these virtual distributed teams are working together. And they were able to uh, be able to build um, a platform within a short time of um, about nine weeks. Um, we managed to deploy the first release um, in, the, in the month of October. Now, what does this mean to businesses? If we use um, DevSecOps as a practice, the best uh, global practices, we're able to at least turn around uh, March releases in a shorter time and be able to build uh, solutions that can be able to empower customers, not only to have uh, control over their journeys, but also to be able to at least manage um, the customer that they are serving. 
So our ambition is to at least give um, micro and um, SMEs at least a self-service journey that can be able to enable them to order, discover our products, and be able to at least um, have a way of interacting with us for the support um, services. Now, DevSecOps has been um, quite important for us. I know time has gone, but I would be um, handing over to John just to summarize. But it has been helpful to us in terms of um, at least bringing these, uh, these teams together to work and use open source technologies and uh, be able to move a bit faster in, uh, in terms of delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, team. I know we've taken a bit of time. I think the one thing I'd like to leave you with is this. The customer is more important than technology. Many times, sometimes we put technology ahead of the customer. Sometimes we operate like you must go live no matter what. Our mantra now is we are moving from feature-based KPIs to customer-based KPIs. Moving from going live no matter what to going live with quality no matter what. I hope you enjoyed our DevSecOps talk and Agile. Looking forward to interacting with you. Thank you, sir. My name is Peter Masharia Karyuki. I'm in the business of selling LPG. I realized the lower class was not being able to access LPG because of the cost. And My name is Peter Masharia Karyuki. I'm in the business of selling LPG. I realized the lower class was not being able to access LPG because of the cost. And when we were able to provide cylinders that were not very expensive, then the market was able to take it up. We have a fleet of trucks. We have to keep in contact with our drivers. Previously, we allocated them some amount to get airtime. Some would misuse that. Sometimes you'll not get the reports being sent back. I reached out to a lady called Brenda who works with Safaricom. She came over and she explained to me about Shiriki. And for the last three months we've been using it, we are able to distribute among all our employees. We've been able to save quite a substantial amount because it's costing us less than 50% of what we are using previously. We are finding it's a service that is very good to an SME like me and others who would want to use the same. Get Shiriki by dialing star 234 star 11 hash or visit safaricombusiness.safaricom.co.ke. All right. Once again, please, a round of applause to George, Elizabeth, and Alan for that multi-pronged presentation. Of course, uh, George Jogona, CIO Safaricom, moving fast without breaking things. Asante Sana, George. Uh, he stepped out of the room. Okay, of course, we've got uh, his colleagues here, Alan and uh, Elizabeth Asante Nisana. Thank you so much. Now, we just like to remind you, we have engagement going on on our social media platform, CIO Africa, at CIO Africa, both on Twitter and LinkedIn, and the hashtag is hashtag CIO 100 Awards. Let's keep that conversation going. Also remembering we have uh, participants, more than 100, who are actually following the conversations happening here on day two of the CIO 100 uh, Symposium on the Hubilo platform. Uh, that is the virtual platform that we're using for this. You can also take part in that uh, platform. Quite a number of features that are also included in that platform. And I'm told there are a couple of uh, nice goodies that are being given away on that platform. So just in case you'd like to not only interact here face to face, you could also make use of that amazing platform which we've been using since yesterday to just get that whole aspect of involving us here at Makutano and at Sarova White Sand and those who are following the engagements on uh, the virtual platform. Right now, I'd like to welcome our next presentation just before we go for our tea break. We also have the a key engagement coming up right after the tea break. That is the Guru series by Safaricom. We'll be telling you a little bit more about that before we get there. But right now, please help me in welcoming a lady who is not a stranger to us. She has been at CIO, but of course, she's progressed on with an amazing career that she's had in technology. Help me in welcoming for the next presentation. That is Laura Chite, the CCO Stepwise. She's the Chief Commercial Officer at Stepwise and has been in the industry for more than 20 years, 
debuting as an HR executive for Geopath back in 1998, where she served for two years before joining Microsoft. Now, of course, uh, Laura is also the co-founder of the Hanovation Initiative, an amazing engagement there. And she was also, as I said earlier, the CEO of CIO Africa for four years. Karibu Sana, the floor is yours, Laura. Thank you, Eddie. Huh? Me, your mic guy is still following me. <laughs> it's okay. Hmm? Oh, okay. Good morning, everybody. Okay. You want to take a tea break? Lunch break? Jane, hi. It's good to see you. Hi, Ken. Should I continue calling everybody out? Chris, how are you? Paul, thank you for hosting us. Michie, how is the hair? <laughs> it's so good to be here, um, being hosted by CIO Africa. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Secondly, happy Men's Day. Ladies, clap for the men. So I saw something today um, on Men's Day. And I hope the men in the room, this is how they operate. Just hold on one second. I'll tell it to you just now. Um, something to do with a real man. Just one second. I'll tell it to you just now. And it's food for thought for our men here. Okay, here we go. Men of quality do not fear equality. True or false? True, right? And I know this room is full of men of quality because you do not fear equality. And why do I bring this up? Because yesterday I was uh, listening to Ali's panel, okay? And there was a lady in the room called Waidera who asked a question because based on the description that we were given of the panel session versus what was addressed, we went very technical. By the way, Waidera, I am not technical. I'm an economist by training, but I love technology, okay? So you'll catch up with me, don't worry. And I'm also a marketer. But the thing is, at some point, at some point, I could feel the pain of those who do not understand hardcore tech and I could feel the pain of the underserved in the community. And this is why myself and my co-founders started Hanovation. Because we are looking for a way to grow women in technology. And not only technology, IT leadership. Very important. Okay? So, as that discussion was going on here, I hope all of you were having that food for thought and thinking about how do we grow the underserved in our communities today to give them an equal opportunity. Whatever programs you come up with, great Safaricom. I don't even know who puts somebody to speak after Safaricom. In a I don't know how I'm supposed to handle this presentation, but anyway. Um, George and his team, great. You're recruiting talent and all that. But where are the underserved? I'm sure there's a lot of focus on the youth. But where are the women? I'm glad to see there was a lady presenting from Safaricom. And where are the persons with disabilities? Okay? So, food for thought around that. Food for thought around how we portray ourselves as women in technology and generally as women in the professional world. Um, the program that um, EABL is running. Um, Program, the program, Progressive Portrayal of Women in Media, Advertising, and Entertainment. And I'll add that, even technology. We need to think about it. How do we portray ourselves? Is it in a positive way? Do people want to hire us? Do we proudly um, talk about our achievements? Are we brave enough to come up here and share? Those are things we need to think about. So, who has ever heard of Stepwise? Wow. Thank you. 
My work here is to talk about the new organization that I work for, that I'm very proud of. Um, I'm a happy child of CIO East Africa, later CIO Africa, but I've moved on to other things that I'm very passionate about, working with the underserved in our communities. Stacy, is this thing supposed to be like this? Okay. So Stepwise Incorporated is an organization that focuses on working with the underserved in the community. What do I mean by underserved? We focus on youth, women, and persons with disabilities. So I'm just going to walk you briefly through what we do, how we do it, how we're changing lives and transforming lives. And my topic today is technology, jobs, and the future of work for the underserved in the community. I think I'm having a technical issue. So Stepwise is a company that is based out of um, Austin, Texas. Um, but we do have a big operation in Kenya where we offer several services from a technology perspective. Um, we focus on software development, we focus on BPO services, and we focus on technology training. And basically what we do, we recruit, we have a team that goes around and scopes, we recruit, train, and place um, the underserved in our communities. Place them in organizations like yours, or we absorb them as an organization. And when we absorb them, we actually use them to build enterprise solutions that you can consume so that we're able to sustain them within the organization. And this is all because of the power of technology. The only reason we're able to do this is because technology allows anybody to work from anywhere. And that means they, they don't have to move from point A to B to access the workplace. From wherever they are sitting, they can deliver services. Am I good, Dan? Yeah, so wherever they are sitting, they can deliver their services. Still not good. I love the power of tech after I've passionately talked about it. <laughs> and it so happens that the former child of CIO Africa is the one whose presentation is bringing the biggest problems. Well, it's all good. So, so basically what we do, we have a software development house where we build solutions and we push out the solutions and we hope that all of you will be able to pick up the solutions to engage your customers or to deliver services if you're in the public sector. Um, besides that, can I go now? Thank you. Great, there we are, a round of applause. The way I've talked a lot here, I hope somebody has tweeted something. <laughs> okay, wow. So, what is our challenge as Stepwise Incorporated? We are actually focused on, the, on four SDGs. One, sustainable cities and communities. Two, to build quality education, reduce inequalities, decent work and economic growth. But how do we do that, okay? Um, we try to support and grow um, socially responsible businesses. Because it is important for us in whatever we do, we operate in communities as we are, okay? No man is an island. But within our communities, are we being socially responsible? What is the impact we are having in what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis? We try to create jobs and career opportunities for the underserved within the community. We try to give them hope. We try to transform their lives. We try to have impact in what we do. And we do this in a space where we are experts in, which is technology. Three, we try and upskill people from the marginalized and underserved communities. Because truth of the matter is, in as much as we talk about it, there's nothing much we do about it. That's just the painful reality. We never think about it. When our HR people are recruiting, they don't think beyond that. Okay? I don't know if it's a matter of convenience, if it's a matter of pressure, if it's a matter of not thinking out of the box, or it's a matter of culture, if it's a matter of profiling, I'm not sure. But we don't think out of the box when we're recruiting. Yeah? And unfortunately, we leave out a huge piece of our talent, forgetting that it's those closest to us who also deserve an opportunity. And finally, we try to improve the lives of persons with disabilities. 
because they are part of us, they're in our community. And there's always one question I ask, I always keep asking, who decided they're the ones with disabilities? Could be us. Who made that decision? Who defined it? Food for thought. So what is our mission statement? We prepare an inclusive talent pipeline and create sustainable employment for a technology-driven world. You know, the way they say COVID flattened the curve, if you really think about it, technology did that. It did that. It created equal opportunities for everybody, no matter who you are, where you are. As long as you have access to a device, you can do some amazing stuff wherever you are and deliver. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about this. So, we have three companies um, under Stepwise. We have Daproim Africa, which is our BPO service. We have Zalego Academy, which is our training um, organization. And we have Zalda, which is our software development house. Um, I'm just going to show you a little bit around how all of them come together and why we have these three different businesses we sit sitting within the organization. We train. Okay? I talked about recruitment and training. We train. What do we do with who we train? We give them jobs, okay, in our BPO center. Or we give them jobs in our software development house. Because remember, we train them in technology. What do we do with them again after we train them at the academy? We place them in jobs. It's as simple as that. We make sure they are able to sustain themselves, their families, and their communities. Because once you transform one person with disabilities, or an underserved person in a community, or a woman who's been abused and has no source of income, but has five children, once you transform her life, the community is transformed. There is hope, she's able to feed her children, she's able to take them to school, and she's able to live with dignity. The same goes with persons with disabilities, just because of technology. It makes a big difference. And that means, especially for us Kenyans, devolution works. Why? Because technology enables them to work from where they are. So the money does not leave the community. It is invested right back and spent right back. Think about it. It's a whole cycle. So talking a little bit about our BPO um, organization, DAPROIM, there's three things we do and offer. One, we offer call center services. <clears throat> Two, data annotation. And three, data processing. And as I said before, our work is to make sure we empower everybody in the community and give them equal opportunities by them being able to offer a service and they are paid for the service. We serve as Step Stepwise's Global Service Delivery Center, and you will see that in the list of customers that I will share later. Our services are offered to um, public sector, NGOs, commercial, uh, private sector, whoever. So if any of you needs any kind of BPO services, we are here to offer you um, the services. Secondly, we have our training academy. And our training academy is a very unique academy. Okay? It is the most accessible school in Africa. Why do I say that? We have sign language instructors. That means we are leaving no one behind. We have wheelchair accessible space. All right? So basically what we've done, we have trans transformed our center, our training academy, to be able to be accessed by anybody. The best thing about technology is that we, were we are now able to stream out our training um, courses. Our courses have been built by practitioners, not academics, so they are real. You will find that our students, once they go through training, they actually do projects before we release them to any organization or before we absorb them. And they are assessed based on projects. So they do real life projects that would be a real life scenario within your organizations. 
So you're not taking people that you need to train them. Again, you're taking them in to be able to give them immediate assignments. Okay? We have several partnerships. We work with universities. We work with um, high schools because we do realize that um, a lot of um, kids nowadays, and especially with COVID, they started getting un involved in technology and they love technology because of these devices. They can't stay away from tech. So we start training them early so that they can start realizing um, their passion or start picking up what careers they're interested in. Okay? So most of them during school holidays come and join us and they do their training. Um, those in university, maybe from around second, third year, they come to us and they're able to upskill a little bit. If you guys remember, a lot of the kids who are called to university, is it last year or early this year, bailed out on uni and they went to other tertiary training institutions. So where are they? And if you think about the tertiary training institution, institutions, most probably it's a lot of practical things. So we try to offer the technology version of that, okay? And of course, we have partnerships with corporates who are interested, if you're interested in offering any training to your teams um, and staff members or your colleagues, you can always come to us at DAPROI. And then finally, Zelda is our um, software as a service um, organization where we offer software solutions that, as I said, can be consumed um, by you. We focus a lot on data science as a service. Um, AI is very important to us. And of course, we do a lot of enterprise software development. Um, as I said, the students who go through the Lego Academy, some of them are absorbed into, um, into Zalda, and we train, mentor software developers. Yeah? So if you want to have your own in-house software development house and you don't know where to recruit them and you have a um, policy around working with the underserved, please feel free to reach out to us. We will hand them over to you. If you want to outsource the service, feel, feel free to reach out to us and we will build um, your software solutions. So the impact we've had. We have trained 8,600 plus workforce. 25% uh, of the workforce are people living with disabilities. We have served 300 plus customers across five continents, the power of tech. Remember I said our main delivery center sits in Kenya, but we have served five continents. We have given out 1,600 plus scholarships for needy students to be trained in technology. We have done 150 plus AI projects and we have 90% employment rate. Are those numbers amazing? Talk of impact. We are what you called a B Corp organization. If any of you doesn't know, please just go and check it out online, B-Corp. So we help you achieve that aspect of your business that sometimes you don't think about where you feel you have to give back and do business responsibly. We help you achieve that. So if any of you is interested, please let me know. I'm sure uh, I don't have to reintroduce myself. These are some of our clients that we've worked with from a global and local perspective, and we're still trying to grow, grow our client portfolio, and um, we look forward to hearing from some of you. We are celebrating our 15th year anniversary this year. This is why it was shocking that none of you has ever heard of us, but anyway, I'm here as the noisemaker, but um, 15th year anniversary, and we hope to do another 15, 20, 100, and celebrate with all of you. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And I look forward to seeing all of you in the evening. There are about 3 million people with disabilities in Kenya, according to the International Labor Organization. Persons with disabilities continue to experience adverse socioeconomic challenges than persons without disabilities. Yet, disability cannot be a criterion for access to education, employment and the realization of human rights. We at Stepwise are inspired to change this. As a B Corp certified company, our mission is to combine the power of technology with talented individuals 
to deliver high quality, socially responsible PPO service. The goal is to achieve 5% employment for people with disabilities by employing more persons with disabilities. The question is, how do we make this a reality? As one of the original founders of Impact Sourcing in Kenya, we leverage on the power of technology to train and equip persons from historically underserved communities, particularly the youth, women, and persons with disabilities to compete and succeed in the fourth industrial revolution. We continue to provide a global workforce solution powering emerging AI technologies such as autonomous vehicles, chatbots, and self-checkout retail. Through our training partners at LEGO Academy, Stepwise connects accredited talent with the right tools to help global companies solve AI-related data challenges. As a result, we have trained over 8,600 people, 25% of the workforce are people living with a disability, powered over 150 AI projects, and served more than 300 customers across the globe. Together, we make an impact. Once again, please, another big round of applause for Laura Chite, CCO Stepwise. Thank you so much, Laura. Now we take a break uh, for about 15 minutes before we come back for a very interesting and a very special moment for this second day of the CIO 100 Awards as we join Safaricom as they unveil the Guru Series. That's under the Safaricom business at the CIO Symposium this today, right after the break. This is a monthly series about hearing from various technology gurus driving thought leadership. You just need to join us so that you can also find out how emerging technology is being, or rather is being helped, or rather helping companies to provide a better customer experience. Remember, our hashtag is CIO100 Awards. Continue having that conversation on Twitter and LinkedIn at CIO Africa. So we come back in the next... Uh, Let's make it actually 20 minutes. So that should be around by five minutes past midday. So let's have our tea. That's on the Makutano Garden just outside the Makutano Auditorium. And then we'll be back by that time for the continuation of the second part of the program this afternoon. Karibuni sana and enjoy your break.
you know the problem?
and then you can't say more on this side. Oh, there I am. Oh, you can hear me.
All right, and welcome back after that tea break. It is the second day of the Africa CIO 100 Symposium and Awards. I hope you've enjoyed your tea break as we wait for the rest of the participants to come in. We will just kick off with the next part of the program, and this is a very special one because Safaricom Business has decided to launch this series, and that is the Guru Series being a monthly series that will be seen as to bring conversations from technology gurus, driving through thought leadership engagements and providing a deep understanding of how our enterprise solutions shape technology companies. Now for today, you'll need to tune in and have this conversation and it is understanding how technology is emerging to help companies to provide a better customer experience. And I have a panel of heavy hitters here, and they are all representing various institutions. But more importantly, Safaricom is a very big thank you to Safaricom. And this will be driven, or rather the conversation will be driven by Ellie Mathenge. And she will be conversating with Chris Senano, Chief Enterprise Business Safaricom. Chris, of course, accompanied by Rose Muturi, Managing Director, East Africa Branch International. John Kamara, Founder and CEO Afia Record and Other Labs with Jane Moy, Chief Information Officer, Standard Chartered Bank. Over to you, Ellie. Thank you. I really appreciate. You all feeling all right? Grab yourself a cup of coffee. Okay. Today I ask you to listen, to understand. And at the end of it, I'll have, give you an opportunity to ask some questions. So my name is Ellie Mathenge. I have the pleasure of running this series together with Chris. So Chris... Um, I'm going to ask you to um, share briefly about the Guru series. But before we start, I would love us to trend, even if it's briefly, tag at CIO Africa, tag at Safaricom Business Guru Series, and at Safaricom PLC. So hashtag at Safaricom Business Guru Series, at Safaricom PLC. Got that? All right. Can we have this session trending? And you can tag me to yours truly at Eli Mathenge. Super. So one more time, I will introduce our panelists and in no particular order. So our host, Chief Business uh, Enterprise Officer at Safaricom. Can you give him a nice Mombasa welcome? Right next to me, Rose Moturi, Managing Director, East Africa at Branch International. John Kamara, Founder and CEO, Afia Record, and he's also an AI and machine learning expert, right there at the end. Saving the best for last, Jane Mwai, CIO, Standard Chattered. All right, so let's kick off our session. Chris, explain to us what the Guru Series is and what you intend to achieve with this series. Thank you, Ellie. Um, uh, Guru Series is um, a platform. It's a new platform that we've launched as Safaricom Business. Um, the idea is that uh, once a month, we bring in a guru, like the people sitting to my left and right, and they come and talk to us about how technology is impacting their company or their industry. And the idea is uh, for us to learn um, from these gurus, both internally as Safaricom and also externally our clients. And so it's been a live series. Um, this is the third one we're having. And very excited to be um, launching it here in Mombasa um, together with CIO in the company of real gurus. Thank I you. agree. I agree. Fantastic. So we're streaming live. So for those people who are sitting behind their laptops, feel free to tag us along. And all our panelists, all of them have Twitter handles, so kindly find them. All right. So let's get into the, the meat of this conversation. So new intelligent technologies can be useful, right, at enhancing but not replacing the human face. And I know enterprises are turning towards the use of technologies to enhance customer experience. So this is to you, Chris. Talk to us briefly about customer experience and how it has evolved in the past years. So I, I think the key, one of the key things that has happened in the last 10 years is that the expectation of clients is, has changed. 
Um, a lot of this has to do with digitization. And obviously, the last two years, um, having all been stuck somehow either at home or confined spaces, um, companies have either risen up to the challenge and changed their user interfaces in a way that clients find it easier to engage with them, or those companies have other, I mean, companies have had to step back. Ultimately, um, customer experience or superior customer experience comes from the ability to give your clients a very convenient and easy way to engage with you. Whether it is to buy your products or to complain about your service or to get an upgrade or just normal interactions. So ultimately, uh, the companies that take advantage of digitization or digital interactions to engage their clients are the clients, are the companies that are going to come on top of the list in terms of great and superior customer service. Okay. So that's a good segue for you, Jane. In a very competitive market where digitization is at forefront, um, and the banking industry has to stay on top of these emerging technologies. So explain to us how these new technologies, and feel free to tell us which technologies they are, are impacting your products, your services, and how you are interacting with this customer whose expectations have changed. Yeah, thanks, Eli. Um, before George left the stage, he talked about um, customers being king and everything nowadays is being curated for the customer. Obviously, that translates everywhere we are. So even in the banking space, we've got to think about who are our customers and what do they want. Um, if I take Standard Chartered, for example, uh, we launched a digital bank about two years ago. Um, and what we've seen is that literally 95 or so percent of our customer acquisitions are happening through this channel. We've also seen that um, our age profile has gone down to an average age of about 35. And you know what that means. These are digital natives. So they want things like this. Um, so we've also had to change our products and things that we offer to then meet this particular group. So we have deployed a lot of uh, machine learning, AI. Uh, we have APIs with third parties as well, just to make sure that we can have the products that our customers want. If, if you look at what happened in the last year, um, last year when we, when we went into COVID and everything accelerated, Everybody then moved online. The sellers moved online, the buyers moved online, and of course the banks had to move online. Um, and then you have the different timings that people do things. Not everybody uh, wants to go to, not everybody wants to bank between eight and five. People are banking outside of the normal hours, which then means you've got to make sure that everything is available as well. Uh, so you've seen um, in our bank, not on the customer side yet, we don't have the chatbots, but on the corporate side, we do have chatbots. So that our customers can, you know, if they're doing a transaction or they want to know something, even if it's late into the night, they can still get the kind of information that they want. So we've, we've seen a lot of that happening, and I've seen it in the other banks as well. Um, a lot of other banks have the WhatsApp banking, Facebook banking. We're banking everywhere now. So we've gone to meet the clients where they are and meet them at their needs, as well as meet them how they want to be met, because not everyone wants to come into a branch. We are now digital natives. I like that. And I can only imagine this is transitioning everywhere. So John, um, I find your work quite intriguing. And as you work towards enhancing patient experience, so. Are you using the same technologies that Jane talked about, AI, machine learning, to revo revolutionize patient customer experience? Um, yeah, the, the journey of a patient in, in healthcare is a very unique one. Because, you know, I always, um, we all have access to our banking data, everybody here. Right. But if I would ask you a question, where is your healthcare data? Right now, please come forward. Don't think about where it is. <laughs> Nobody, and that is the most important data to you. Mm. Not even your financial data, your health data is the most, you, you don't have access to it. So technology has been able to allow us to bridge that gap. So what we're trying to do is create a situation where when I ask you that question, you can go and 
your phone and you say, this is my healthcare data from the last hospital that I was in. This is what happened to me. This is what I'm doing with my doctor. And when I go to the next person, I can also then provide that information to that doctor. It's basically what you can do with the cost of healthcare, more importantly, you can create an efficient patient. And it's called a patient-driven ecosystem. So healthcare has to change to the patient. The same way banking changed for the customer. It's not about the hospital or the doctor. It's about the patient, because the patient, ultimately, everybody's a patient first. Even if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, whatever you are, you're a patient first. And the day you get sick is the day you realize. So technology during this COVID period has been able to allow traditional institutions see the fact that if you don't put the patient at the centerpiece of healthcare, the cost of healthcare, the service of healthcare will never change and will continue. So we, we basically first take the first step, which is really how do we use the technology to marry healthcare and treatment? Treatment happens in the hospital, healthcare happens outside the hospital. Technology helps us to bridge that gap. So is government playing a critical role in ensuring me my data is protected and Jane doesn't have a version of it, Rose doesn't have a version of it. I mean, that's also, a, that's another whole conversation around data. <laughs> but the first thing is, do you have access, first of all? And what government does, you should do, is make sure that the access you have is protected by right of the state. Now, who else has access to it is dependent on a number of different types of things. Then you talk about governance, and then you talk about privacy, and you talk about accessibility. So all these are different spheres, but what we look at first of all is access. Can I have access to my, can government make it possible for me to have, if I live in Isiolo in a small little village and I go to Mombasa the next day, can that hospital or can I be the one? Because the only possible person, I am moving around nonstop. Right. I mean, I think the, the real key issue over there is the portability of the data, the health data, such that if you move from one clinic to another, you can, the doctor in the other one mm -hmm. can have access to the information that the previous one did. And just to ensure that as, as a digital citizen, mm -hmm. I can move mm -hmm. with my, I, I don't have to go back to this particular hospital because that's where my records are. I think really, from a digital point of view, that's really where we are. There's work. Yeah, exactly. yeah, there's work. I feel vulnerable as a patient, and I can only imagine the person who's layman down there, how they would feel. But that leads us to a good question when it comes to access, financing, and lending. Um, I'm in Isiolo. I'm in a jam, and I want money. So branch shows up. You know, it's available. So how do you effectively make lending decisions? So you must... I want to assume you are using some type of technology to access my credit to see if I'm viable. How do you do that and have a quick turnaround so that me sitting in Isiolo can get treatment fast because I need the funds? So explain to us in a nice layman way <laughs> the process and how these technologies have improved your process and turnaround times when it comes to issuing out these loans. Great. So. Uh, for Branch International, what we say is um, we use data science with a social conscience. So essentially, we've been in business for over six years now, so in Kenya, in Nigeria, in India. <clears throat> and based on the fact that we tell the customer that they can download the application and give us some rights to access some data, we're able to disperse the loan to them in under three minutes. So. Essentially, the, the use of artificial intelligence is very key to us. We do a, a lot of machine learning as well. And that, what that helps us do is to get a lot of information, and it's all anonymized, so there's no human being seated somewhere trying to understand what does it, this data mean. And we actually had done an experiment, so that I can answer your question, where we put a few individuals in a room, and we gave them some anonymized data, and we told them, if you got this kind of information, would you approve this loan or would you not? And no single individual had the same response as the other. So the fact that we use machine learning and we use artificial intelligence removes all the bias. And um, interestingly, the person who was least biased is the one who, um, you'd say happy-go-lucky, the one who has no judgments or you know which church do you go to or what do you do on a Friday night, they didn't care. So when we were looking at who 
had the best score, if you will, when they were coming to, to judge the applicants. And she was quite young. She actually came out with the highest score because she didn't have any, you know, like if you worked in credit for such a long time, mm. you form your own biases about a customer. She didn't have it. She was quite, um, she was just over 18. And she said, well, I think this person can pay. I think this other one can pay. And when we actually went and approved those loans based on the feedback that we got, she, she got a high score. So to eliminate all these biases, we use um, a lot of data. Um, everything is all automated. There's no single person who works on the information. And uh, going back to what John has said, um, who owns the data in terms of your medical records, I think um, you ask yourself, if I had possession of that data as a patient and I'm keeping it on my phone, who else will get access to that information? So it, it, it actually brings another conversation to that. But how do we end up lending or how do we end up uh, giving the individual the loan? Um, once they ac accept our terms and conditions for us to access the data and it's completely um, public information on our website, we tell you which data sets we're going to be accessing, uh, whether it's going to be the GPS data because we are, we are primarily on Android so that we can be able to see which location you're at, um, which type of SMSs are we, be, are we going to be able to access and things like that. Um, we are able to automatically crunch the data and uh, disperse the loan to you. So how has this morphed over the few years that we've been in business? So you find there's a reason why six years later we're still doing what we're doing. We're still growing as a business. We're still expanding into various markets. And just the fact that the, the way we've trained the system, the way we've trained the data, we are easily able to launch into a brand new market because there's a lot of information that you get at one single instance and you can be able to derive a lot of decisions from it. And you don't have a lot of capital, uh, it's not capital intensive, because today if I look at the credit team and the data science team across the globe, we have at least 12 people uh, who are dispersing over $13 million a month. And if that was someone going through paperwork, you would need a whole lot of people. So um, the use of technology has helped us to, to be able to churn out volumes in different countries. Our credit team works off of, for instance, today the credit person working in Kenya is actually able to use data for India, is able to use data for Nigeria as an example. So we don't necessarily say, because they sit in Kenya, you'll only work on Kenya type of, um, of data. You can actually be able to work on any. So that's how we're using, we're leveraging on technology. I'm really trying to keep myself from asking you data-related questions, but uh, like you said, a conversation for another day. So then this leads me to Jane with your very highly regulated industry. And I'm sitting there thinking every time I go to a bank and someone is judging me because of my last name, someone is judging me because of the address in which I put on the banking application, how are you using these emerging technologies to overcome some of these regulatory compliance issues that are making you guys being left behind? I don't know how else to put that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. We do live um, in a very highly regulated industry. Um, but obviously, we do work with our regulators just to make sure that we are all um, keeping on up and up. But the one thing that you find with these technologies is that it does also help the regulators. Because you have, um, of course, you know, money laundry is a big thing, uh, terrorist financing, and, and mm -hmm. so on. And this technology does help us know what's going on real time. There's a lot of data that's flowing through. And having um, algorithms that will then run through the data and pick up pointers that will say, OK, Ellie, Ellie's doing something that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. So then we can now dig a little deeper into what Ellie's doing. But if you can imagine if we didn't have that, this would all be done retrospectively. So we'd be finding out six months later that actually Ellie was doing something wrong. Whereas today, because of um, having all the algorithms in place and you set up all sorts of rules, you can then tell on the spot as you look through uh, um, Ellie's transactions that there's something going on. So that's how technology has helped. Um, same thing with account opening. I told you we open our accounts, 95% um, of our accounts are opened online. And again, you can't do that um, if you follow the traditional way of somebody comes in, fills out a form, 
gives you the ID, you photocopy, you go and look somewhere for this ID. Today we're doing all this digitally. So you'll take a selfie, um, we have your ID, we'll go to IPRS, all through technology. Mm. So within literally seconds, you have an account and you can start transacting on that account. So that, and that helps also with the government because now there's a whole thing around KYC. So we can say, yes, this is Ellie and this is her ID number and this is her PIN and, and so on. Um, and having the, the interactions with, with the regulatory bodies obviously does help um, because they are also opening up APIs so that we can trade information with them. So we're, we're working together in this heavily regulated industry. Um, there's still more we can do. I think we've seen some of our neighbors talking about um, cryptocurrency. Nigeria <laughs> just launched the <laughs> era. Um, so yeah, so, so we still have a ways to go with how technology can then move to the next level. Um, within within Kenya, can, can I throw? A Absolutely, can, can I, throw I a know. A I am yeah, with you. Go ahead, ahead, Chris. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so, 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 Jane, it's true. Most banks are now giving us ninety-five percent to do the stuff offline. But can I throw a challenge that after we've done all that, we don't have to go to the branch to collect the password, or is it the card? You know, that last bit, why can't you just send it to us using drones or something like that? <laughs> Genuinely. Yeah. Oh, can Standard Chartered be the first? We are actually yeah. able to do that well, in Nigeria, okay. so we are, we are I can, I can jump in. <laughs> the G4S. Yeah, but, but we will get to the stage where you can use a digital card. But, you know, we've got to work with the regulators to allow some of these things. <laughs> so it's a regulatory <laughs> issue. Okay, it's <laughs> our. <laughs> but in their defense, I think they're trying the digital app part of opening an account, I think, is quite um, innovative. And you said within minutes, so you beat um, Branch in their three minutes of scoring you on credit, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, super. All right. Um, I think technology is so interesting. You can always keep talking about it, and it can keep veering off, but I want us to keep on course. So, Chris, Safaricom came, then they brought M-Pesa. Our lives changed. And now we get to see a homegrown organization evolve. So how is Safaricom playing in this space? Number one, to improve service to delivery and helping customers um, digitize. So um, I think the first 10 years of Safaricom was based on pushing out uh, a lot of voice communication. That's what we needed. Um, you're looking at 2000 to 2010. Uh, 2010 was the launch of M-Pesa, and obviously M-Pesa has revolutionized most of our lives. These next 10 years, we see ourselves moving from being a telco to being a techno company. What does that mean in English? It means that we want to help using uh, M-Pesa and our network. Um, we want to help end users and SMEs specifically to leverage that platform to do their businesses. So we're talking about access to market, access to finance, mm -hmm. um, and what I was talking about before, the digital interactions. Specifically on Safaricom business, one of the things we're doing is having conversations with our clients to see how we can help them um, digitize their front end. So more of a B2B2C um, type of interaction. And I'm sure most of you have heard of the M-Pesa uh, super app our business app. Mm -hmm. Those are platforms that we are offering to different verticals to put their businesses over there. M-Pesa um, has over 30 million people using it uh, all over the world. And so therefore, that obviously is a platform that can be used um, for, for a good experience. Um, we're preaching the message of digitization. Obviously, the more we do, the more the banks also do. Um, I, in some of the chat forums, there's or always... The, or the more we do, the more you do, the, the, more, the more we do. But ulti ultimately, together, we're building an ecosystem which says, um, let's give convenience to the end user, let's help them uh, digitize their own business, and let's uh, find a way of using these platforms to the benefit of everybody. Super. If I can just add on to what Chris has said, um, we do have to work together. I mean, we all have to work in tandem. Uh, a few years ago, we probably looked like competitors. There was a person on one side and then there was a bank. Um, 
but we've, we've all got to work together uh, with fintechs as well, with the regulators, mm -hmm. with the telcos, with the medical group, mm -hmm. everywhere. Because our customers, they, they, they're all about experience, uh, how, how, how it feels, right? It's not about, I am just going to go to Safaricom. They will go wherever they feel the experience is good. Mm. Okay. So if we all then work together, we can then now make it a better experience for the people who are out there who want to use or pick up our products or use our services. Can I just say something there? So, I mean, I think this, what year did you think, Tessa? 2010. 2010, this is about 11 years ago. Uh, you took a leap of faith and you jumped into this interesting technology space. Do you think in the past 10 years you've actually taken a leap, another leap of faith anyway? Forget a super app, but like, in real technology, do you think the American was taking a leap of faith into the next as a leader to say, okay, we're not going to push the boundaries of technology? Yeah. Not a super application. I, I, I mean, it depends on what you mean by leap of faith. Going into Ethiopia is a leap of faith. Yeah. Leap of faith. <laughs> <laughs> so, you took a leap of faith with the tester. That's never understood before. So that is a massive leap of faith because you came from nowhere to build something that nobody did. Now, there are all these new forms of technology as well that could really leapfrog what mm -hmm. we're talking about, digitization. Maybe when you ask me the next question, digitization is, yes, it's good, but it's not really the ultimate form of what we're doing in technology. And in Africa, where we have the opportunity to leapfrog the rest of the world, um, so do you think that embracing new forms of technology, Safaricom has actually pushed itself to do that? So, so yes, definitely. I mean. The session before Laura's had um, our CIO, George and Alan, and I think one of the things that definitely is being done, we're, we're doing a lot with AI. We may not be screaming about it, but um, we, in, since January to date, we've hired over 700 developers, and the reason for that is actually to bring, to build an ecosystem um, working on different types of technologies to ensure that we keep ourselves A, abreast, and B, ahead of the curve. Um, I may not be, because we're a public company at liberty to tell you all the secrets that we're cooking up, but all I can say is just watch this space. Fantastic. I think any organization in technology has to always continuously be thinking again, lest you become a Blackberry that just didn't think through. Um, and it makes me just, you know, go back to your point, Jane, where we have to coexist. There needs to be a Safaricom, and there needs to be a regulator, and there needs to be the banks who react to whatever other organizations are doing. So I think there's space to coexist, and there's always space for trailblazers. So um, you've answered my question about digital transformation. So I want to go back to you, um, John. Um, in regards to the robotic process automation. And I think all of us, when we hear robots, we go into a sci-fi kind of space, you know. Yet on your phone, you're constantly interacting with your phone and it has artificial intelligence on it. So how is RPA changing the process of engineering and what impact does it have on customer experience? Um, I think RPA, which I'm sure most people know, basically allows you to get things done faster. I like to explain things in a simpler way. Um, it helps you to go from point A to point B actually really quick. And across multiple industries, especially financial services, for example, in Treasury, using RPA, people can actually process automation quicker and faster, but also get the same end result. Uh, if you look at ATMs now, that are able to do multi-layer RPA solutions as well. Again, you can go from Treasury to ATM to the customer getting his money, and that is also robotic process automation. So everything from all that paper that you carry around in the treasury, in the finance department, all those things. And even if you look at it in industry as well, the same thing as well is happening. So is it, is it making people's lives easier and better? Yeah. It's a, sometimes the customer doesn't really know what is happening behind the scenes. But you know, when you look at process automation, so many companies are adopting it across the world right now. And mo mainly a lot of financial service companies who deal with so many heavy moving paperwork and who deal with a lot of calculation when it comes to how they have to repurpose their financing and how they do audits, all these things. So they basically run even multi layers of process automation, which automates and checks the RPA as well, so that you have you know zero tolerance for error. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but for me, I think the, the, the place that you really want to go is things like, you know, um, zero knowledge encryption. You know, that's where you want to go because that's really where you're talking about nobody can have access to your data apart from yourself. You know, when you start going into creating secure IDs that are based in multilateral agreements in part, you know, where you then say, okay, that data that I had, especially in healthcare, you know, it's not just enough to digitize healthcare data because anybody can still hack that data. You know, so why don't you put that data on the blockchain? Why don't you put that data somewhere where it's immutable, somewhere where it can't be tampered with, somewhere where you can't, nobody can transfer that information and be encrypted with zero encryption. You know, when you're able to do things like that, then you're saying, okay, well, you've gone from where we are now, where we have the opportunity to digitize, but if we digitize with new technologies in mind, compared to places in Europe where because they digitize, the cost of doing all these forms of new technology becomes so expensive. Uh, so the opportunity to really take hold of super smart technology and add it to the digitization process is where I think it's really exciting when you talk about new technology. You know, the first is you can be on top of it. <laughs> so why don't we have the opportunity to do it in, you know, in one stretch? So um, RPA is really exciting, but you know, it's stuff that a lot of institutions are doing right now and it's helping them. But you know, what for me, what I'd like to see is institutions who take it one step and say, okay, look, how do we really, really encrypt data? How do we go to zero level cryptography in information? How, do we, how are we able to use that same information when we analyze data to create blocks that allow us to actually make that data completely untampered? So those are the things that, especially in financial services as well, you know, those are the things that I feel that we have the opportunity in Africa to do without necessarily looking at the rest of the world and saying what are they doing. You know, we, we are, we're digitally transforming ourselves. I just came from Zambia. All I had was digital transformation. Mm. So if you have the opportunity to go from zero to 10, why not go to 100? So I have a question <laughs> on that. <laughs> so. I like the fact that you're talking about encryption even to the individual level as an example. So if you look at the at Africa and some of the challenges we may face where we have what you call institutional voids. So the, the towns or the major cities will have connection to electricity or whatever else you may need. But the far flung out areas you find, those basic things will not be there. So if you're talking about let's encrypt to the lowest level, I'll give an example of when Safari comes started in PESA, and it, it just sounded like this weird thing where money's gonna fly in the air and no one understood what we were trying to say. They had to again train us on this is what we literally are saying. What do you think is the challenge you're facing today? Is it the fact that, even for me as a, let me say I'm a layman, you're telling me to encrypt my information. I, I go crazy when I don't remember passwords, so I put one for <laughs> now we know. Yeah, yeah, so I'm gonna give you my password later. But so what does that mean for that person who is not necessarily interested in being tech savvy? They just want protection. They just they don't want anything extraordinary. For that person, they don't really know the difference. <laughs> they just know that. So are we saying we don't care about them? <laughs> Either it's in the village or in the city, it's the same level of work. If you're going to digitize either from scratch or paper or from semi digitization or whatever you want to do. So, at the end of the day, when you provide the person that service and you tell them their data is secure, they, they, they don't necessarily are worried about how secure their data is today. Mm -hmm. Today. But tomorrow, once they begin to understand the value of that level of encryption that you put on their data, then it becomes light bulb moment. But you've done it today anyway, and they still access the service the same way they do, maybe on the USSD. They don't, it doesn't matter to them. The service is still the same experience, but what you've done behind the scene is you've saved time and money that you have to use next time to do the same thing. So that, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying we don't care about them. <laughs> we can still help them. <laughs> uh, what I was gonna say is, um, you do make an interesting point around the technologies, and I guess, being where we are here in Africa, the biggest challenge is getting our regulators to move at the same pace that we would want to move at. So if we're talking blockchain, then everybody needs to say, yes, blockchain is where we go. Uh, because you can say, here, yeah, I want to do blockchain, and then I go to CBK and they say no. 
um, or I go to IRA and they say no. So <laughs> that sort of kills that right there. Um, but you're right, we've got to use or think of um, leapfrogging and going from zero to 100 and not zero to 10%, as you said. But we have to make sure we carry everybody along with us, um, which means the, the regulators have to be with us, um, the financial institutions have to see that it makes sense, the ministries have to see that it makes sense, because today you'll say you want to digitize, um, I, I think it was, I, I recall the late uh, Fernando talking about blockchain and how that could be used in the insurance agent, uh, industry. And I remember his comment was somebody would insure his big um, Range Rover in like five different insurance companies, have an accident and collect from all five. Yeah, so he gets back the cost of his car and he can buy another three. Um, <laughs> so at the time, and that was, it was a few years, a few, a few years ago. Yep. And he was saying at the time, these are the case studies that we need for blockchain. And even now, we are still talking about it. We don't have it. So how then do we get from this, from this place where we are here talking and actually making these things happen? And how do we carry everybody along with us so that we are all on the same page as far as this is concerned. Because yes, these are great technologies and they do make a hell of a difference. So how do we make sure we are all together on it? I think that's the bigger challenge. And I think I said it to you earlier, um, if there was no effort of a Safaricom way back, we would have not had an Impesa. There has to be someone who's a trailblazer, who's willing to push those doors so that these technologies can then happen. Otherwise, there'll be stories we'll be talking about that in 2020, there was AI that could stop people insuring their cars in 10 companies. I think it has to be a deliberate effort in each industry that there's someone pushing those doors. And maybe it's the same companies that keep repeating it. You know, once you're bold once, you can be bolder and bolder and bolder and open those doors. So I don't see why the banking industry couldn't go back to some of these regulators and say, hey, we have products for insurance. We want to push this. How do we work together? They already are listening to you. And so before I, I turn on the questions to the audience, I wanted to talk to you about, and I, I can imagine you can open a whole uh, Pandora's box in terms of identity theft. So I, you know, get someone's phone, I find they have a Tala app, whatever, or I even have details. You know how every time you walk into a building and you're told to sign your ID, right? And I have all those details and I use those details to open an account with branch. How do you verify it's actually me? And have you, I'm certain you've probably seen instances where there's two people claiming to be the same. And one of them is saying, no, that's not me. Yeah. So actually a very good question. And um, essentially what we do, and that's the beauty actually of artificial intelligence, there are some patterns that you can already detect when it comes to fraud. So, mm -hmm. and you'll find just based on doing this over the years, based on collecting um, a lot of data over the years, you can quickly predict how a particular behavior is going to be. Mm -hmm. So by the time someone is downloading the app and going through the motions to the point where we are able to disperse, that's uh, the three minutes. If you're a repeat user, of course, it's um, instantaneous. We are able to identify the flags that we have modeled within the fraud type of um, segment. So this actually happens across all the countries. So in Kenya, we're happy that there are databases that you can plug into the national ID repository. But when you go to places like, for instance, in Tanzania, various types of IDs are accepted. So with that in mind, you allow the customer in, but you have another layer of checking what other flags will this person exhibit to show that they are tending towards fraud. So this is how we look at it. We don't necessarily say that just because you raised a flag or two, you're automatically a fraudster, because it could be coincidental. But due to the fact that it is not a human being assessing those data points, you find the robot will actually give uh, what you call the confidence level to say at 90% we believe, or at 90% this particular user is good to go and you find it goes through a very very small manual uh, process where if for instance the individual had a different name from what they've registered with our contact center will be able to chat with them because we don't do phone calls um, and that's because of the age group that you deal with they're, they're better off chatting with us and we tell them this is what we're facing we need you to provide something or the other and that's done it takes a very short time and that is usually for a very very small 
percentage. For the rest, we've uh, been able to model across all the different countries, how does fraud look like, what should we look out for, and we can safely say that we are able to protect the users. Um, the cases we used to have, I would say maybe four years back of um, phone theft um, and someone else applies for a loan have materially declined. Mm -hmm. And thanks also to um, that new feature that Safaricom came up with where if someone goes to register for another line using your ID, you'll be notified. Oh, that super. actually has made a big difference. So that's why we collaborate and partner with them because the symbiotic relationship helps. We know for sure as they prevent fraud on their side, they're helping us also to prevent fraud on our side. So it works out for the best. Power of partnership and the amazing work that technology can do. All right, clap for them. They've done an amazing job educating you. And earlier I said, I hope you were listening to understand. Now this is the time to use what you understood to ask some <laughs> questions. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, this is a question for, for Rose. Uh, I've, just, I've just downloaded the standard chartered application and I'm actually going through the process. I'm able to take an image of my ID. Uh, by the way, my name is Mandeep. I, I'm a business development manager for Aquant. We're a digital identity verification provider that works globally. Um, I love what Standard Chartered is doing. Uh, clearly, they're taking an image of an ID. I think the next step will be I'll take a selfie. So this is more a question for Rose. Why don't you do the same? And that's a good way of, of doing it. You know, you, you're checking IPRS but everyone has a smartphone and they, they're doing a loan application, they have an ID, and you can do a selfie check. Why, why use AI mm -hmm. when you can compare that? Uh, the banks are doing it uh, globally around the world. Um, why isn't branch? Uh, same question for Chris as well. Um, I was speaking to a South African friend, and he says it's, it's, it takes a long time to get an m -Pesa account pay bill. Why can we not make it any faster? I'll stop there. Those are great questions. Okay. Over to you. All right. So the reason why we are not using um, selfies for now is, I wouldn't say it's intentional, but it's because of how we were acquiring the users from the beginning. And the fact that we are able to confidently identify the customer we did not want to include a, another barrier where we tell you to take a photo of anything. So here is an example. When you look at Tanzania and the fact that they're able to use various types of IDs, and we would tell them, hey, send a photo of this or show us a particular image, the, the user experience was really poor. And we said, as opposed to make a customer jump through hoops in order for them to give them in order for us to give them a loan, yet we are able to confidently identify who they are, we're going to leverage on our data science and on our expertise. Now, because we're in the process of um, becoming um, a neobank Pan-African across the, um, the continent, you'll find some, uh, for instance, like in Nigeria, they do have a different um, level of acquiring the KYC information due to the fact that they offer versatile products like they can take deposits, they can give investment services through the branch app. And for Kenya, when we get to that level, definitely we will need to increase the level of KYC, um, at least according to the regulator. But that's just purely the reason. We didn't want to add more hoops for the customer to jump. Mm. Yeah. Chris. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> you don't know, Chris. <laughs> Look, most of, most of the systems are now automated. Um, I think in the past it did used to take uh, quite a while, while, specifically on the pay bills. You, you need to understand that just like the banks' uh, pay bills, we need to be sure that we're not allowing people to fund terrorism and stuff like that. Mm. And so that there's always an extra check that we have to do. Um, I can tell you that most of our systems have moved on to self-service now. And because of the digital stuff that we're doing, I would say 48 hours. Um, but if you wanted to 24, see me when I walk off the stage, <laughs> I'll sort you out. 
you have witnesses. So anyone else asking a question, kindly introduce yourself and maybe the organization you work for and then proceed with your question. All right, right there. All right, uh, my name is Pauline from Unga Group. I have two questions. Uh, one, I think I'll address Jane Y. Um, okay, in my opinion, I think uh, private sector is moving faster than the government in terms of innovations and technology. And uh, we, f uh, we find that what that happens is that we are being derailed behind. So um, what, what are we doing as the stakeholders in ensuring that the government is um, moving at the same pace as us? That is if my opinion is true. You can help us on that. And then my second question is to Chris on uh, m -Pesa customer. If I want to be just uh, an m -Pesa customer for your online services and not a voice and SMS, can I register at the comfort of my couch? Thank you. You know, you've asked a very difficult question that I'm not so sure I can answer, um, not really being a spokesperson for the industry. Um, but I, I think what we, what, what we need to do as private sector um, to make sure that we do take everybody along with us is to make sure we have a lot more of these kinds of sessions and invite the stakeholders that we need to invite to participate in these sessions so that we are all sort of having the same kinds of conversations. One of the things I've seen in, in I think, some of the government or the, regulator, the regulators is that they do give a lot of training to their staff. So there are probably people there who are trained on blockchain, crypto, all those things, but they have the knowledge and maybe nothing much is happening with it. But if we are all sitting here and we are all talking about it, and I'm sitting next to somebody from the Ministry of Finance, and I'm saying, you know, crypto is the way to go, and they'll be trained on crypto, and we start having these conversations, then it becomes something that rolls and, and becomes something bigger. Um, but I think it's, we do need to engage um, with our regulators and with the government, and keep having conversations around what it is that we want to do. So for the banking industry, um, for example, we need to be engaging a lot more with our regulator and telling our regulator, this is, this is what we want to do, this is how we see it, how do you guys see it, what do you think, can we, do it, can we do it this way, can we do it that way? The same for the people who are here in the insurance industry. Have those conversations with your regulators. And I think if we have a lot more conversations and a lot more of these kinds of engagements, then I think we can start to see a lot happening. Um, I, I don't want to comment on the fact that we are ahead of them, <laughs> <laughs> or, or they are ahead of us. <laughs> I'll leave that bit there, but I think we do need a lot more engagement with our stakeholders. Um, Jane, I think maybe if I can be on her side a bit, I think the reason why the question was to you is because it's a global bank and there are some mm. of these technologies you're already doing in other markets. So you literally have, like, you know the way you're told, push the envelope. You have yeah. every right to do so because you've tried and tested elsewhere. And I think uh, the regulator will be more welcoming to you versus entities that are not regulated by them. Yeah, yeah uh, and that's true. And we do have those engagements with our regulator, but it's me and the regulator, not me, ABSA, CDN, <laughs> all of us having the same conversation. And I think that's where she's getting at. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Pauline, um, but I think it's more of an industry thing as yeah. opposed to us as an individual. But yes, we do have the engagements and we do tell Central Bank, mm -hmm. this is where we are at, this is our strategy, this is where we want to go. Yes. And then we, you know, we walk that journey. Yeah. But then that's me walking that journey alone. You and may not necessarily get everyone, because mm -hmm. remember like when Pesa Link was starting and I think only five banks said, hey, let's do it. And they said, we're going to go ahead. Now the rest are queuing and are being told, okay, you need to do this, you need to do this, yet the first ones have the advantage, so 
Please take advantage. <laughs> What's this thing? <laughs> and I think it's catching up with the rest of the world because in other parts of the world, and especially the first countries, there are lobbies, there are people who actually work with regulators to push these agendas. And it, it, like I said, it has to be a very deliberate, intentional effort where it almost comes like from a selfish place where you're pushing, you're like, we want to do crypto. So how do we align and have the regulator agree with us? So. And it's businesses like you guys. You guys have deeper pockets. You're all over the world. Can lead those conversations. <laughs> Pull a safari come in who's local and then push these conversations, the right? Deeper pockets indeed. <laughs> to, to answer the question, mm -hmm. um, yes, you can have a line. You can use them Pesa by itself, but you still need an identifier, and that identifier is mm. a SIM card, and that SIM card has a number. Now, of course, we would rather you use all our three services, <laughs> the data, the voice, and the M-Pesa. But if you insist on using other network, that's okay. M-Pesa, you need a, a number. Um, you could, it is possible to pop it into a tab, and so you could, uh, you could operate your M-Pesa line from maybe a tab. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's no, there's no restriction. You, you don't have to buy uh, voice minutes for that. All you need is the verification. Um, of that particular number, you can go ahead. Um, and, and just to update my great, if it's a temporary pay bill, we, we normally do that within 24 hours. You know, because of weddings, funerals, and other special occasions, sometimes people need a temporary pay bill, and that we normally process within 24 hours. Um, but that's for temporary. But then again, I, I, the, you need to know people. <laughs> You asked the right person for help. Uh, just to add to what you said here, I think also part of the thing you should do is with regulators, as we've seen in other countries, is you must show them the benefits for them first. Yes. I think that's what most people don't really understand about smart regulators, why regulators are always the lead. You know, there's a few countries in Africa where we're doing stuff with regulators now, and it is because we, first of all, what value you bring into the regulator first before yourself. Because mm. once he's able to understand the value that you're bringing to them, then it becomes a lot easier for you to have a conversation about your own self. So we went to a regulator in the DOD of Zambia, and we, we first talked about what they would benefit. And it took a while, but they got it. Now they're about to implement things that everybody said it was impossible. So I think also kind of looking at how you engage in that conversation rather than saying, do this. No. <laughs> Maybe they say is find a problem that they truly have, which that thing can solve for them. Then from there, obviously, you then get yourself a shilling. <laughs> <laughs> Present a win-win situation. I think there's a question here. No, right there, the, behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Meshi. I'm the CIO at Triple OK Law. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one goes out to the entire panel, since you've all mentioned you're using AI in some capacity. How do you remove uh, biases, not just in data, but in the algorithm? Uh, that's one. Second question is uh, directly to Rose. You mentioned that your data is now anonymized. Is it fully anonymized, or is it still anonymized? And if it's fully anonymized, I'm very curious to, know, to understand how the AI is able to connect the dots between two different data sets in order for it to do its decision making. Okay, Thank let's you. start with you as the rest think of how they're going to answer the first question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the first one was, okay, should I answer the anonymization? Uh, answer your question like, about anonymization, okay, yes. Cool. <laughs> So, and I hope I'm gonna do the question justice because I don't deal with the data science bit, I open markets, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and give it much, um, justice. So essentially what we do is, we do have a, a credit team and we do have a data science team. So when it comes to how we build the policy, how we build the products and everything, the credit team will be able to create, this is what we need or we want the customer, um, the customer who will qualify to fit in. So what the data science team will be able to do is to say all this information is coming into this big um, port of data, but nonetheless it can be retrofitted back into which individual um, is attributed to which particular ID. 
So we do not share with anyone or any individual. No one will have access to see this ID belongs to person X, but you can actually be able to match the data points based on what we're getting, because each, each unique data point is identifiable back to your, to your ID, if you will. Now, one thing we've been able to do today, and we're very excited that we're going to launch it um, in a couple of weeks, due to the fact that we have new, the, the Data Protection Act in Kenya, we're able to uh, do what you call forgetting a customer. So for any user who comes and says, I, and, I, and it's part of the law, so that a customer comes and says, I need you to forget me. We are actually able to track backwards and forget that information for the user. What is still IP is the learnings we get from all the data combined. But for your information tracking backwards, we are actually able to um, forget that information. So we are, we've, we've done quite an extensive exercise on that, and it should be going live, um, I believe, 1st of December, because we're in the final phases of it. And we're really excited that we are able to fulfill the promise that, one, your data is secure, and two, if you need us to forget you as an individual, we're able to do that. So when you come back again, you will apply afresh. We will start from the beginning. But um, so that's how it works. I don't know whether I'm answering the question fully, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best from <laughs> since I'm not in DS. <laughs> Basically, you expand the data from the system. Yeah. Yes. Apart from now, the the learnings, the learnings that, or the behaviors that you get from that data. Yeah. So no credit history. Your credit history is gone, or do you still use that? Uh, no, no. So your credit history you is come gone, afresh. But whatever we learned based on your patterns is what we shall keep. But we shall okay. not attribute it back to you. When okay. you come back, you come back as New. an individual. Okay. Yeah. But you That's cannot game the system because due to the fact that we have lots of data, your behavior doesn't change. When you come back in, there's some things you will do <laughs> the same way you normally do, and you'll be able to predict so your So you don't think people behavior. can reinvent themselves? Uh, unless they... I don't know. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> All right. I'll, Algorithms I'll, and bias. I'll, Biasness. I'll, I'll pass on my opportunity to <laughs> the AI himself. So I know there's a few more questions. So yeah. yeah. How do you deal with biased nature? Do you, do, you, do you write programming languages? So what do you use? You use Python? So in the beginning, when, when you're writing a, a programming language, you are the one that is controlling the language system. So if you don't understand the theories of ethical AI from day one, and the theories of ethical data when you use that data to create um, what we call emission control systems, people can, do, can decide to create different types of modules based on exactly what they want the protocol to deliver to them. And most people do that nonstop. So a lot of what we do when we teach people AI is the ethical nature of the data that you sell and the value between the ethical nature of data and the things that you want to get out of that information. Because if you don't make people understand the potential long-term outcome of an, eth an ethical way of writing AI programming, everybody will get affected. That's why potentially robots will kill the world, right? We talked about that. So, that is, so we spend a lot of time on ethical AI, and Uzai just don't really think is a very important issue, but it's an extremely important issue in machine learning, in how you look at data, in how you look at the subsets of data, in how you look at the protocols, or even the efficiencies you write into the model itself. So when, that, when you do that, which means that somebody can't write a program that would change what they want to do, because I can write a program as an AI engineer, even though they say they do AI, and I can literally change the outcome of all the credits as well. Mm. Technically, I can do that. <laughs> right? Mm. But because if I understand the ethical nature of it, so that's why. And then what do we do for, so for us, in specifically speaking about the healthcare space, we develop our own um, IP, which we call MPOD, got an MPO theory. And the theory of the MPOD is because we take from anonymized data, and when we take that data, we create another level of non-descriptive data. And at that level of non-descriptive data, we then break it down into different sets of parts. So each part contains a particular subset of non-descriptive and anonymized data. Mm. And when you map it together, it gives you an understanding of what the potential in the future can be. So which obviously means that data is also unhackable because you can only hack one part. Even if you hack one part, the other ones will automatically begin to automate the system. 
Yeah. So that is our own particular IP that we develop. We use a combination of blockchain and AI to develop our own endpoint here. And that is what we use to say anything. When we secure the data, it allows us to say, yes, that data is truly immutable. So I can share more about our architecture of the endpoint here. All right. He is passionate. Can you feel and hear the passionate? He can actually have a, you have a whole session on a class on AI and encryption and all those, so find him. And unfortunately, time is up. I know this was one of the juiciest sessions you've had here, so please, a big hand of applause for my panelists. <laughs> this is a good time to tweet, share something you've learned, um, redirect people to the Safaricom PLC page to retweet. So again, thank you, and I'll hand it over back to the MC. Wait, just say one thing. Though. Yes. Okay, just like just 30 seconds. Five seconds. I think it's really important that we kind of look at where Africa is at this minute, and we understand that the future of this continent is really in the mind of the individual. In each person's mind lies the future, because the future that we're talking about is actually happening around us at this minute. And all those smart technologies combine to determine how we use that future for now. It's not tomorrow, it's not gonna happen the day after tomorrow, it's happening right around you, but the whole concept of it is in your mind. The way you re-engineer your mind is how the future will pronounce itself. All right, and food for thought. A big hand of applause that's for, the for John. Why we have Guru series. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. Over to you. Thank you, Eddie. Uko on na Safaricom. Switch to month for free to leave. <laughs> yes. Once a month and enjoy <laughs> streaming, browsing, texting, and calling worry free. Join on my Safaricom app or dial star 544 hash today. Uko on, uko on, uko on. Real guru. All right, uh, a very interesting conversation there. Ellie, thank you so much for leading this conversation. I know many more questions. I wish we had more time for this, but definitely we're also still celebrating the launch. As you've seen, this is the actual launch of the Business Guru Series, which is being thank you. driven ahead by the Safaricom <laughs> business. And this will be a monthly series about hearing from various technology gurus, driving thought leadership engagements, and providing a deep understanding of how our enterprise solutions shape technology companies. So please, once again, come on, Jachoka. Let's give our panelists an amazing conversation. I think this is the longest panelist that we've had, and I'm sure there's still a lot of insights that we can dig in from this topic, which is how emerging technology is shaping the customer experience landscape here in Kenya. So I've been telling you about the platform where we have the virtual engagement going on. We have participants, more than 100, who are following through this conversation in the day two of the CIO 100 Symposium. Now, here's something that will keep you, you know, interested in going to this platform because it's also an opportunity for you to walk away with some nice goodies and also just to experience a little bit about the virtual space that we are using. Now, we are asking you to interact with the platform. You can set meetings within the platforms. You can engage uh, and view sponsors' booths. And now, as always, we have gifts for the most engaging participants. Now, listen to this. The person with the most points, due to engagement, you'll get, get some goodies. Now, this is by setting up minutes, visiting the booths, and visiting the different features while watching virtually what is going on on this platform. You get a chance also to win some two nights stay right uh, with one of the sister hotels, that is Sarova Woodlands. Number two, the most active on Twitter today, day two, with the hashtag CIO100 Awards, gets to win two nights stay at Sarova Lion Hill. I believe that is in Nakuru. Also, the Woodlands, of course, are of a sister, uh, sister resort is in uh, Nakuru, that's the Woodlands. And also, you're being requested to leave your cards at the reception area, plus also fill in the feedback form, and you'll get a chance to be receiving a certified class by African E-Development Resource Center. For, of course, for more information, if you'd like, you could uh, kindly go to the reception and just get more details on that. But there's also a good one, get a selfie. You need to look for a lady by the name of Ellen. Ellen is with uh, CIO, Ellen Magembe from the CIO East Africa. And of course, now it's CIO Africa. And then you need to post that photo together with Ellen. It's a selfie. 
and with the hashtag CIO100 Awards, and you get to win some amazing gifts that are going to be handed over today. And also to remind you, before we go for lunch, as we exit for lunch, I'd like to remind you, please collect your gala award night tickets at the reception. Ensure you collect your ticket at the reception. And now we move on to the next panel discussion. And this is, can AI provide better vulnerability management? And of course, vulnerability management is key to securing a company's network. Now, an average company deals with many threats daily, as you may know. And it needs to detect, identify, and prevent them to be safe. To drive this conversation, please help me in welcoming to the podium Kevin Karioki, who is the business development lead and product manager at Evil. He will also be joined by Imran Chaudhry, country manager East Africa Fortinet, virtually. Omaru Maruatona, who is the CEO iClass, also will be joining us virtually. Michael Michie, CIO Triple O. Hello, Kenya will be joining us face-to-face. Uh, -face. And also Juan Rodriguez, EMEA Sales Director, Digital Identity and Trust will be joining us virtually. So can we have Kevin Karioki? And as he comes up to the podium, he was with us yesterday, an interesting, very deep conversation we had yesterday. Karim Sana, Kevin. And also, I believe, Michael is joining us also. Please give him a round of applause. The next conversation, as I mentioned to you, can AI provide better vulnerability management? They will have three more panelists who will be joining us virtually. Kevin, the floor is yours. Yep. Um. Right. Um, hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for making time. Um, today, we are going to have a very interesting conversation um, around... Uh, how AI can help with um, vulnerability management. Um, maybe just to set pace or um, have the ground rules um, or set the tone for the conversation, um, I'd like us to review um, what would be ideal business priorities um, for, for any business. So um, just to recap the conversation we had yesterday, um, business priorities um, for any organization looking to move forward, um, we classify them as three. So you have uh, security, customer experience, and innovation, right? So any business that's looking to um, move forward, right, or have solutions that uh, would give customers a good customer experience, you have to tie down um, security. Um, as of uh, 2019, November, Kenya passed the Data Protection Act, right? And um, that particular piece of legislation um, was geared towards one fundamental uh, right that we have uh, and is protected by the Constitution. So that's the right to privacy, right? So, um, and maybe we could start with you, Michael. Um, do you feel that uh, AI, right, artificial intelligence, um, is able to provide better um, vulnerability management? So maybe you could start by um, defining vulnerabilities and, and how that can be managed. Uh, all right, thank you so much. Uh, well, I'd start off by saying let's, let's look at vulnerability management as one discovering potential zero day discovering anything which can be exp can be used as an exploit against your organization and then to your question is can ai do a better job 100 percent yes and we don't we can't react as fast as ai that's one ai has access to more data than we do ai gets faster insights uh, than we do of course then there's the issue of false positives and if the AI was fed with any bias uh, data or was programmed with any bias in it, then there could be red flags. But then again, humans all also make mistakes. So in that case, I believe 100% AI can do a better job. In fact, at our organization, I do have an, we do have an AI that pretty much does the role of the CISO and we do the, the rest of the heavy lifting. Okay. Um 
Juan. So Juan is joining us online. Your thoughts on um, vulnerability management using AI. Right. Um, sorry, Juan. We are unable to to get to you. Sorry. I can hear you. I can hear you, Juan. Ah, yes. yes. So, I, can you hear me? No. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So, <clears throat> just to, to uh, what I was trying to say, AI for me is changing the game of cybersecurity. Analyzing massive uh, quantities of risk data to see its response times and augment uh, under resources security operations. So for me, it's bringing a lot of benefits to the cybersecurity. Uh, and for me, the most important is, uh, above all, the detection and response times, which would be boosted. Integrating a, an AI with cybersecurity is one of the greatest methods to detect and respond to attacks in real time. Uh, those technologies exam, examinate your whole systems uh, for risks. Unlike humans, <laughs> these technologies will detect uh, risks early, uh, risk early and make your security operations easier. So that's what I think uh, about AI. Yep. And obviously, it will improve a lot uh, comparing to human uh, people, human operations. Improve a lot, a lot. Okay, Omaru, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, look, thank you for, 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 for having me. I, I, I think the, the the value of AI is is you know slowly sipping through the masses. Um, it's now almost public knowledge that AI is a powerful is a powerful tool. But I I, I, I differ slightly with uh, with with with, with, them, with everyone on on this, just only slightly. And 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 where I differ is AI is good at uncovering novel. Which is new um, occurrences of, of 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 an event, right? Where AI, I think, needs to be managed better is where we know something, uh, what we call deterministic cases, right? Um, you'll find that in terms of programming and and processing, um, when you have a virus that is very obviously a virus, you don't want that virus being processed by AI because AI typically uses mathematical models and algorithms and that takes a bit more processing time that than a deterministic, you know, uh, 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 approach. So I think for me, right, you don't want to totally replace uh, deterministic uh, methods with AI. You want to complement the two of them and you use the AI for novel cases and you still keep your deterministic controls for for what is known, right? Because what happens over time is once a threat, um, uh, a vulnerability, an attack pattern is known and is determined to be malicious, you know, using AI to detect it in the very first instance, that's powerful because in some cases, nothing else can do it. But, um, um, you know, an artificial neural network or a statistical approach. But once that happens, that case, will, which we call a case in a, in a technical sense, that case then needs to be moved to, um, you know, your deterministic controls because they are very faster in determining known, um, known signatures, right? So I think, you know, my opinion is, um, you know, having having developed AI systems, um, I know that they can be process heavy, and therefore you don't want to you want to reserve them for for where they really can change the dynamics of of the detection and, and the analysis. So you know, in a nutshell, that's that's what I think. I think complementing deterministic controls and AI, and having an architecture where AI comes in 
uh, if a case is new or if a case has not been encountered before, then definitely. Um, so, so, Omaru, if uh, by definition, um, vulnerability management for organizations is often quite uh, uh, cyclical, right? So you have your identity, classification, uh, prioritizing and, and remediating and mitigating your findings, right? So um, in that case, um, there are plenty of aspects that um, if you think about it, different teams within the organization um, can look at, right? So in this case, when you say we're gonna collapse all these different functions um, to be done by AI, um, do you see there's a, there's a possibility of, um, say, creating false positives, some form of bias when it comes to, to AI? Yeah, look, yeah, that's, yeah, for sure. It, it's in the nature of AI because the way any artificial intelligence approach works is by observing historical cases and then making inferences, making models about what those cases form. In some cases, they form, you know, what we call a baseline model. In some cases, you use those historical patterns those patterns to form, um, to form, you know, a boundary or what we call a, a threshold, and such that anything above a particular threshold is good, anything below a particular threshold is bad, right? So to get that threshold right, you find that given, you know, the amount of data that the model has, sometimes you overgeneralize, which means the model is you know, is, is setting the threshold a bit higher than where it needs to be. In some cases, you undergeneralize. So, you know, false positives are part of the learning process for, for programming a machine. So I think, yes, it's powerful to collate different feeds, different um, um, data logs, different data points in order to have a better picture, uh, a better picture of what uh, a threat looks like, a vulnerability looks like. But in that process, it's a given that there will be false positives okay. in the early days. Okay, um, uh, Mike, Michael, a question would be, sorry, sorry. looking at the uh, Data Protection Act, um, some of the requirements is, is how long you keep the data for your customers. Um, when we talk about AI, there's a, there's a need to hold data so that you create those um, assumptions and those uh, algorithms Right. So, so at the wake of the new legislation that defines how long or how much data you can use, right? Then, in that case, um, how would you go about that? Well, I don't think that's a limitation in, for any good AI. Uh, basically, how AI learns is it first needs a large set of data, then it starts learning from there. Once it's learned something, it doesn't need to go back to that data. It doesn't keep going back to that data and relearn the same thing to make a decision. It now has its own inferences and its own decision-making uh, scheme that it can work with. So now you don't need that data anymore. So that data can then be, can, if the client wants their data back, they can get it back. If the data needs to move away from the AI, it can be moved away from the AI. Another step that you could do is the pseudonymization of data. So remove descriptive terms, but then as you notice, as a lot of, if you notice a lot with AI, the smarter it gets, with the more data you feed it, the harder and ha the smarter it gets to the point where even with non-descriptive data, it's able to, to connect random data sets and decide this is Kevin. Right. And no one, would have, no one, no set of humans would have done that, but then this one AI does that, and that now raises the question. So even with anonymized data, well anonymized or well pseudonymized data, this AI is still able to infer and make this decision. And this now brings us to what we have the challenge with AI. AI will always tell us an output. Really, it can't, it's quite difficult to sort of get that rationale. How did the AI arrive to X? So that's the black box problem with AI. You know you want it to show you vulnerabilities, it will show you vulnerabilities. You want it to help with customer data, it will help you. How it got there, you don't know. It will tell you I'm there, it's an 80% match. It's either you take it or you leave it. Okay. Um, Juan? W what are your thoughts? Yes, mister. Yeah. 
So um, just to rephrase the question, um, it was around um, how much data, um, and, and this is a global um, phenomenon we are seeing where most um, countries and regions and blocks are setting out pieces of legislation that govern how much data can be used um, for individuals, right? A, a huge part of AI yeah. is how much data you have to be able to make those inferences. Uh, <clears throat> from my point of view, this is a, uh, a, it's a, a hot topic right now with all the different regulators in the market. Uh, depending where you are, some regulators are defining a certain time in order to keep some data with you. But anyway, what you have to think is that uh, the majority of companies, when we are thinking about cyber security, all data we can collect from all the different uh, verticals, from all the different sectors from the company, are essential in order to try to mitigate the risk. So uh, sometimes when we are talking about uh, personal data, in certain countries, they are thinking to give them a time of several months to keep alive those data, but in others, even uh, giving you more than a year. So anyway, the most important thing is that if we are using systems like uh, AI, uh, from my point of view, I mean, uh, are essential, and as my colleague before was talking, uh, I mean, yes, we are using so many heavy data uh, by using sophisticated algorithms, uh, but this is, these systems, these AI systems, are being trained to detect the malware, okay? To run patterns recognitions, uh, to detect even the minutest behavior of malware or ransomware attacks before it enter into the systems. So that's what I think. Data are very valuable for us, are very important for us, uh, and uh, we should keep them as much as we can if we want to avoid potential future attacks. Even if, depending on the legislations, we should really <laughs> be uh, aligned with that and compliance with that. Right. Do, do you think we have the right tools um, um, to perform these tasks uh, for organizations um, here in Kenya, for example, and in the region? Do we have the, the right tools that are capable of... Um, um, centrally managing all this data so so that you're able to do your your, your AI inferences? I mean, the, uh, there are different tools available in the market. Definitely, from the technical point of view, uh, exist technology. Uh, maybe in Kenya, you are starting adopting some new technologies. Uh, it's not really well adopted uh, so far because maybe the cost is very important, it's very sensitive in terms of pricing. But uh, I do believe that exists today enough technology in order to start uh, uh, using this type of uh, uh, AI technologies in an effective way. Uh, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a matter of time, for sure. You maybe will need a little bit more time in order to accommodate new technologies, new features, new capabilities that exist today in the market, which allow a AI system to really be proactive, effective, and efficient for all these deep, uh, types of activities. But it will be a matter of time. It's not going to be long, you know. So in very short time, and thanks above all to the COVID situation, uh, this pandemic that is changing dramatically, the whole uh, digital transformation world, you know, uh, we are going to observe huge changes in short term. So we are not going to need to wait five years, six years in order to see things like this. Okay, so I do believe that in very short term, we are going to be able, even in Kenya, to start using these types of uh, technologies uh, on our benefits, of course. Okay, Omaru. Um is the market ready? Yeah, look, I think I think as, as Juan was saying, 100% agree uh, with what he's, he's saying. Um, part of what we, we do as a business is we also advise on monitoring, right? 
somebody spoke about AI ethics. I'm not sure if it's in this panel or the, the previous panel. I, I was just listening in on the on the conversations. The big challenge now with AI is, you know, the black box. Um, um, Michael spoke about the black box, which is very few people understand what's happening inside, right? And therefore, with a technology, a powerful technology like AI, you know, you want there to be some kind of regulation, safe use, right? It's a powerful tool. How do we make sure we only use it safely and fairly and it does not discriminate others or hurt other other people? So I think what is still a challenge is how do we regulate the adoption of AI such that it's safe, it does not present harm or danger to, to, to the users, right? I think the market readiness definitely from a capability perspective but from a regulation and policing perspective, I'm seeing um, I'm seeing gaps there. We're, we're, we're doing some work with, you know, other regulators who want to solve that exact problem because you know it's 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 a bit like cyber security. The reason why cyber security is blooming right now is because first you develop the functionality and then you think about securing it after. So I think AI is headed in that same direction where. The capability is there, but the question is, you know, do we have enough breaks in, in, in the event that this thing, you know, has a life of its own and, and, it, and it takes off? So, uh, you know, that for me, that would be one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing from a market readiness perspective. Okay. Um, yeah. so Michael, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts around uh, what you feel um, would be the the human elements that are lost when we consider AI, um, <laughs> when we consider AI vis-a-vis yeah. um, -vis having cybersecurity operations guy just looking at screens and trying to identify threats for organizations. I think the first, the first thing we miss is uh, the key human element we miss is accountability. Because it's very easy to, to decide someone in your in your SOC or within your cybersecurity team messed up and there's a way to deal with that. Yeah. How do you deal with that with an AI? You can't, okay, I'll shut it down. Has it really felt, has it really been punished? And I think that's the challenge with all applications of AI. It's, this thing is intelligent or it's becoming as intelligent as we are or m probably just sometimes more intelligent than us. The question is, what if it, what if it does something wrong? Okay. What are the repercussions? The repercussions for us, we have people get fines, people go to prison, also all types of repercussions. For the AI, you're looking at a, a thing that has some form of intelligence and they're trying to figure out how do we punish it? How does it know this was wrong? And how does it fix that? So that element of accountability, I think is, is the most crucial issue. And I think it's why there's little adoption of AI into CyberSec because I'm, I'm quite happy with our solution for CyberSec where I know my network is being monitored by an AI, emails are being monitored, patch management, quite, quite a lot of, we've developed quite a lot to help with our, the AI. We've spent like six months just learning and now we're at a stage where if something goes wrong, it's, I get called, I'm like, this has happened, that happened, that happened. So the blame would come to me, but look at a large organization, let's say with 10,000 staff, and then the AI makes a catastrophic mistake, costs the organization maybe 10 billion in revenue. If it's an AI that stopped an update for a self-driving car, then the car crashed, then you really can't pick up and say, okay, blame this guy. And the AI is learning. The most important thing about AI is its ability to improve on itself. So it's not the same AI two days ago, it's not the same AI a month ago. Right. So how do you deal with that? That, uh, that level of accountability. We solve that. We could, we could all spend our year in Mombasa just looking at email notifications, having an AI do your job for you. Okay. Um, Juan, what are some of the um, downsides to having uh, AI fully managing um, vulnerability management in your opinion? <coughs> Yes, I, I would like to mention something that I uh, that Michael was saying regarding to the potential replacement of the AI for the human intelligence. Okay, because I think it's quite interesting this topic, 
and many organizations are started thinking about this because, hey, having this type of technologies on board, maybe we could imagine that we could reduce the number of uh, uh, people working in our SOC, for example. Uh, from my point of view, I think that uh, AI is not a replacement for human intelligence, okay? Especially when it comes to identifying and mitigating threats. Uh, but what clearly, uh, clearly it does advance security, cybersecurity in powerful ways, as Michael was mentioning and my other colleagues were mentioning. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, for example, if we are thinking about machine learning identities, unknown threats, imagine, you know, so it's improving the incident response, absolutely. So this is something that it's really important because uh, in order to have a system like that ready and efficient, you need to give them a lot of time, at least from my point of view, six months, you need in order to allow this system to learn, to collect all the data, the data to start being efficient, to provide a less false positives. So, I mean, it's a matter of time, but always, always, from my point of view, the human intelligence should be behind all this. Okay, you, you cannot uh, just refuse the help of our, uh, the, of the human intelligence because these type of machines are really powerful, are really, are more quicker than human beings, but always you need, be, you need someone behind that, behind the scene, let's say. All right, thank you. Um, Omaru, do, do you think we should have policies that continuously, um, that you should continuously review um, the, the AI codes that um, are built? Because they are continuously learning, right? So, and, and that means that if they choose to learn um, something that is more biased, then it will continue cascading to, to build on that and learn on that. Should we have policies that continuously review um, uh, this kind of uh, yeah. code? Yeah. yeah, 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 I think so. I mean, I mean, so far, the developments that have been made in, in that direction is um, AI ethics, right? It's a, it's a large framework that says, any piece of AI should have these qualities in order for it to be determined fair, uh, non-biased, safe, and, 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 and all of those things. And I, and I think the other thing about AI that, you know, is, is often not quite uh, fully appreciated is the, the notion that it's constantly learning, right? You know, again, in a business context, you can have an AI component that is constantly learning for sure. If it is constantly learning, it means additional money. It, it costs more. Another way to set up AI is, you know, because it's all about the data and the context of the data. Let's say you're monitoring a situation where the changes happen every two years. So there is very little business value if you know that the change is happening every two years to run any updates to the models before 24 months because you're going to get the exact same model, right? And in that sense, we cannot, you know, rightfully say that it is constantly learning. Uh, in some cases, the data changes so quickly that every month you have to be replacing the models with the new, the new data that you see. Again, the inconvenience of having to replace the models or update them with that frequency. So there's that part. I mean, having the policies that say, is your, is your, your, are your algorithms constantly learning? But also in addition to that, having the ability to monitor that this policy does exactly what, you know, the, the organization is doing what they say they're doing in a policy. Because it's one thing to say you're doing something, is the other to actually, you know, implement it. So I think, yes, we need policies, we need, the ethics, like I said, the AI framework, uh, but we also need actionable monitoring tools to make sure that those ideals are actually implemented. Okay, um, so maybe we could get like two questions maximum from the audience. Um, comments, yes.
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jackson Kimeo uh, from KMTC. I'm also a consultant um, in uh, cloud governance, cloud security, and cyber security. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, goes to issues to do with um, production of AI chips. Currently, as we know, the world is producing around 2.2 um, quintillion of data every day and areas to do with um, data protection, data sovereignty, and even the governance is very crucial, right? So uh, a technology like edge computing is growing very fast. And uh, there has been a challenge with the manufacturing industry, especially in terms of uh, the AI chips. Currently, maybe you can broaden that area because um, issues to do with the cyber security and um, it's bringing a lot of challenge to the edge computing. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? So that we can take them all at, um, at once. Right, yeah. Let's jump in. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Paul from uh, Safaricom, uh, SACO, uh, and also Safaricom Technology. My question is, yes, we use AI for making uh, you know, data insights, but at what point do you humanize or contextualize data? Because sometimes you can take decisions based on data, but there's a human element, you know, because such as if, if you rely on data alone, you can end up taking wrong decisions. And I'd like to give an example way back user Google Maps. It tells you a shortcut through Dandora, but there's no way where data can tell you that, you know what? <laughs> this might be the shortest route, yeah. but it no, might not be safe for you. Thank you. Oh, you wow. are, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had an answer until you gave your example. Uh, <laughs> anything anything that we have not yet programmed into AI is defined as human intelligence. So this human touch that you think we're missing in decision making is just what we haven't learned to program into AI. Remember anything which the laws of physics obeys, it's called the computation, I think it's called the computation or something. I, remember, I don't remember the name quite clearly right now. Anything in physics that obeys the laws of physics can be simulated in one way or another in a virtual environment or within a program. So by that definition, we started to simulate certain forms of human interaction and human thought into AI. So that last human touch that we are missing is just something we are, we are grappling with how to write it into code. The example you gave really shoots my answer in the foot, but I feel that uh, one of the th what you've mentioned is something called human in the, human in the loop, uh, which is used to remove bias and to check for bias within AI. I think that slows down the overall decision process. I don't understand why I would want this powerful technology. Imagine you're in a Ferrari, you're racing, and then you have 100 meters to go, you park the Ferrari and you start running. Your competition will pedal right past you because you needed that human touch. And you've built this AI to do your work for you and now you're second guessing it. I don't think we should do that, but your example was really good. All right, um, guys, um, Hi, those are um, really interesting conversations. Sorry, Thank you very uh, much. one last. Okay. Hi, my name is Byron. I'm from Liquid Telecom. Uh, my question is to Michelle. Uh, AI has good benefits, yeah? My question is relating to gaming. Yeah, I know you are a gamer. Uh, how will I beat the AI in the game? Because so <laughs> it's, it's outrunning me. <laughs> so in gaming AI or the AI that, use, that is used by NPCs, these are the non-playable characters, are built on difficulty curves, depending on how, which uh, studio is doing it. If you're getting your game, uh, those who play games here, if it's something from, from software, the, the guys who give us Dark Souls, some of the hardest games ever. 
Those games, their AI is built to punish you for failure. It's built to make you just improve your skill. So beating an AI in a game just depends on whoever who wrote the AI decides just how difficult the AI is going to be. Their, their games, uh, I know that level still today, that people are still trying to beat certain hidden levels where it's literally been programmed that it's unbeatable. And the developers have come out and said it's unbeatable. And then you have really smart guys and girls who sit down. Uh, they remodel the game, they tweak the game, they put in some mods and they try. If it works, these guys fix it. If it doesn't work, they keep trying. And that's actually, if you, to really, okay, uh, this is a small tangent. The fact that you've just mentioned gaming, that's probably one of the best ways to understand AI and how AI works in its simplest form and in its most developed form. That's why Google has taught most of its AI's games. And then we are hearing these are the most smartest AI's because as kids, how did we learn things? Games. How are you teaching your AI? Games. The simplest route works. All right. Um, that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you guys very much. A uh, round of applause to our panelists. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Trust. Thank you. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>all right thank you kevin once again another round of applause for that great engagement panel discussion on the theme can ai provide better vulnerability management now we move on very quickly to our next presenter and that is joseph mazenge the coo seriano and he'll be engaging us on looking at the africa threat landscape and its implication on business karibu joseph akija pia mnaweza muongezea makofi ya mombasa <laughs> Thank you, MC. Good afternoon. As mentioned, my name is Joseph Mathenge. I am the person standing between you and lunch. I have exactly 20 slides. I have been given 10 minutes. I intend to do it in the 10 minutes. Please stay with me. Great. My conversation today is a simple one and perhaps an intriguing one. What truly is the threat landscape from our perspective? We here in Africa. I'll take exactly five seconds to describe myself. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Sirianu. I've been doing cybersecurity for the last 22 years. I've had the fortunate experience of doing it in a global market in the US and Europe. I came to Africa thinking I knew it all and I fell flat on my face. It's a whole new ball game in this place and I'm loving every second of it. I work for an organization called Sirianu. We do cybersecurity. That's our bread and butter. We sleep, eat, breathe cybersecurity. We are better known for an annual report uh, that we put out every year. Research on different topics around cybersecurity. It's available from our website. Absolutely free. Download it. Read it. Um, easy read. Read two, three pages. Write out. If it's in the evening or in an afternoon, not much information there. No, I'm actually just trying to mess with it. But this is absolutely available. You cannot do cybersecurity as an island. So here are some of our partners. An organization called PECB. Uh, we uh, have worked very well with the Isaka Kenya, um, Isaka Kenya chapter. Uh, we are the founding members of the Global HoneyNet Project, uh, as well as USIU. And then we run a 24 by 7 cybersecurity command center. I've had multiple people here talk about a SOC and the fact that the way that work can be highly, highly repetitive. And the human element of potentially losing that, I see that on an every single day activity. There is an ad on CNN that opens up by saying that 52% of all the organizations that were doing business back in 2000, Fortune 500, have gone out of business. I thought that was an advertisement. I didn't think it was true, so I looked it up. It's actually fact. Back in 2000, 52% of the companies, Fortune 500 companies, are extinct. Why? They were unable to digitally transform. Here is what customers expect today. Before, if you needed to take a loan, you had to go to the branch, you had to meet with a credit representative, 
you had to give in your information, you had to go back and wait for a decision, then they would call you back in, and maybe you would get your loan. Here is today's reality, and there are a whole bunch of bankers in here. I want to sit on my table, on my sofa, in my car, click, get a loan, within seconds. That's my expectation. Don't make me come into the branch. I hate it. We had the CIO of Stanchart early on. I had a really been taken to task about that last step of going in to get an ATM card. And I'm like, these people, oh my God. They want everything easy. The fact is, we are digitally transforming whether we like it or not. Here in Africa, it's even more interesting. Why? We are leapfrogging stages. Growing up, Getting a hard line into your house was hell, right? It took forever. It was ridiculous. Right now, everyone has a phone. You can reach anyone across the country, across the region, yet we did not have to lay lines across to everyone. We in Africa are going to leapfrog stages, and because of that, we are likely to go quite, quite fast. So when you're thinking about your digital transformation, when organizations are thinking about the digital transformations and catching up with it, there are a number of things that come front and center. Number one, there is a significant increase in your cost, uh, your capital expend expenditure, what they refer to as capex. It jumps, doubles, triples, significantly more. Yes, the cloud services providers will argue that your opex reduces, but when you compare it with what you currently have, it goes up too. You have to hire IT teams who understand these technologies. You have to keep them trained. You have to keep them motivated. So your cost in doing a business as a whole, utilizing technology, that's improving your efficiency, potentially increases your cost. Number two, your risk profile changes. You remember my earlier slide where you go into the branch and you submit your paperwork for you to be able to get a loan? Well, when you go online, that changes. You have a whole bunch of other connections that are coming into your organization, either from third-party services providers or even from your own internal people. Because of this change in your inherent risk, then your cybersecurity exposures go right up through the roof. You're now worried about remote connections. You're now worried about introduction of rogue software and rogue hardware into your environment. You're now worried about other things that those guys in the C-suite, those guys at the board level, don't fully appreciate what all these things talk about, yet they have to pay attention. And then risk of significant lo losses occur in a very small window. I mentioned we run a security operation center. From the time when we detect a breach, from the time we detect that there are funds been withdrawn from one of our clients to reacting, it's a very small window. And there can be significant, significant losses because of this new vehicle that we have put in place. So cyber risk is front and center on this digital transformation. Cyber risk is an area that we here in Africa are playing with something that's significantly different than what's coming from the other side of the world. Now, let's look at cybercrime and how it has changed. There has been quite a bit of evolution. The loss of money becomes number one, front and center. The biggest thing that you're worried about, of course, is loss of money. But within that question, you now have a regulatory, CBK, CAK, somebody else, who is saying you have to report about any cybersecurity events within two hours. Well, that's easy when it's a Monday morning. But when it's... Saturday night, the day before Christmas, Christmas Day. How do you report that within two hours? You don't even know it has happened. The techniques which these attackers are using change literally on a daily basis. They have newer, more improved, more interesting ways to hit you. Financial institutions in this area, not just financial institutions, all of you have had conversations about keystroke loggers. These are those fine malwares that are introduced into your environment with the single intent of stealing credentials. Here's the funky thing about what's happening in Kenya. Yes, you have your antivirus solution that's there, but it has no clue about a keystroke logger that's been written in Swahili. It doesn't know what that is. It doesn't have the signature for it. Yes, it may recognize its heuristic behaviors, but the risk there goes up. And then the targets are changing. The way that they can hit you and how fast they can hit you keeps changing on a daily basis. 
When we look at some of our trends, malware keeps going from worse to worse. 2018, we encountered malware such as Emotet, targeted at hitting organizations uh, and changing the banking trojans that were known out there. In one of our reports that we did, we also recognized the issue around cybersecurity skill sets. Reality, we are in Africa. Reality, our skill set is slightly behind. Reality, we need to train our people to get better. It doesn't change the fact that we are now playing in a global village, and indeed, we have a significant exposure. Now it's impossible to do your business as a single entity. You need third-party service providers to do one thing or another, from your applications that you're owning to running parts of your IT system to hosting your servers. You need third-party services providers. You trust them, but you don't. I mean, how could you? They don't have the same motivation as you do. Yet, absolutely, they have to be front and center in what uh, they're uh, uh, delivering to you. Um, it's interesting to note that high unemployment seems to be a driver, particularly for technology uh, experts. In the last one or two years, we have seen the economy go up and down, uh, impact of, 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 of COVID, uh, of the pandemic period. That seems to be an interesting driver as far as technology experts, technology professionals utilizing their skill set for illegal, um, uh, illegal, illegal uh, activities. And then finally, I want to go straight to the issue of fake news. I hope all of you look very carefully at those messages that come to you that says forwarded. Anything that says forwarded that comes to you, the first thing that should enter your head is fake news. Absolutely. No question. Because nowadays, it's so hard to distinguish between what's good and what's not good. When you get to the point where we are getting the national press uh, sending out messages saying that tomorrow is not an idle filtry holiday, yet it had spread and we were all ready for the holiday, you know? It's moving so fast, you really have to pay attention. This is our reality right here in Africa. Financial sector, the areas that have been targeted, I don't have to really beat the dead horse on this one, going after ATMs and mobile banking infrastructure, your payment system, debit and credit cards. We already talked about third-party services providers. Other non-financial sector are experiencing these issues as well. Hackers, players targeting their payment systems in the manufacturing area, in the insurance area, in, in, in healthcare. They are now paying more and more attention because somebody changed an account number within their financial payment system and somewhere somebody did not get paid. They are now going after our document management systems in terms of uh, um, ransomware. One of the biggest threats in 2020 has been ransomware. Come in one day, all your data is encrypted, and you have a nice little note that's telling you to go and pay some money in bitcoins. How many here know where to get bitcoins? and your data has been held ransom. And the list goes on and on. The face of the cyber criminal has changed. Do you remember when DCI put out such a picture, talking about these are wanted people? This was interesting. And I do a number of these presentations to different senior managers as well as board members, and I keep asking them, if you see one of your employees on this list, what do you do? How many here say fire them? Ah, you saw it. It's a trick question. How many here say don't fire them? I can see one hand. Okay, those who said you don't fire them, supposing they actually perpetuate fraud in your organization. Supposing they actually steal from you. Those who said don't fire them, please put up your hand again. Of course, DCI can put out this information, but you as an employer cannot necessarily act on it because if DCI were wrong, you have a lawsuit on your hand. But that's besides the point. What I'm trying to really emphasize here is that they're no longer necessarily male. They're no longer necessarily techy. The risk is front and center. It's within your organization. Let's spend two or three slides talking about the cost of cybercrime. We are going back to 2016. Cost of cybercrime globally was put at about a billion. That breakdown of cost of cybercrime with the direct cost, money out of your account for that cost, about $431 million. The other indirect cost, $647 million. 
seems to be upside down, doesn't it? How many say that just let it be? I'm okay losing the 431 million. Cost of cybercrime uh, across in 2018, that number jumps up. Kenya specific to 295 million. To translate into Kenya shillings, that's 29.5 billion. To translate that further, that's thicker road. We keep moving. 2017, 3.5 billion globally. 2018, 4 billion plus. These numbers keep going up. I have a slide missing there that I wanted to spend some time on, but that's okay. I'll probably capture my 10 minute target. So the, the cyber risk detection process has changed. How you evaluate cyber risk absolutely is no longer the same. Conducting a vulnerability assessment penetration test is no longer enough. Simply consuming the annual um, uh, audit report is no longer enough. You now have to understand what are your risk exposures. What are those breach scenarios, threat scenarios? What are those things that indicate to you that something's off? Uh, once again, I'll refer to what the CIO of Stanchard talked about, looking at certain behavior of your account transaction and pinpointing that that's an issue. For example, you are seen withdrawing 40,000 shillings three times on a Saturday morning in Mtuapa. Is that okay or not okay? I don't know. Comedian once said that if you're ever on an ATM withdrawing $300 in the middle of the night, something's not good. He was making a joke about it, but if you think about it, yeah, <laughs> something is off. Either someone's sick, or you're probably doing something you should not be doing. So taking that information and using it to identify that something's not correct. For you to have those threat scenarios, for you to have those threat indicators, you have to understand what are your data sources, both for the information as well as for the risk scenarios that are coming in. You need to correlate this data. It's a lot of information that's coming at you. You need to be able to aggregate the things that tell you the same story. And then now you need to do your threat analysis to really bring it together, really be able to identify and distinguish between an event Joseph Mathenge logged in, and an incident, Joseph Mathenge's ID was used to log in while he's physically located here at uh, the offices and also from South Africa. Bringing this date together will now really inform you in terms of what's my incident's response, what should I do, how should I be able to react to it, and then finally be able to report on it. Threats are dynamic. An annual VAPT people is not enough. In understanding your threats, that won't cut it. Threats are dynamic, they are changing literally on a daily basis. How you evaluate and understand that has to move just as fast. Finally, there's this big question about cost and return on your security investment. Go in there and fight for your budget to buy for something around cybersecurity. And trying to explain that to the board that you're buying a new antivirus solution, a new data loss prevention solution, is just not interesting to them. So you need to be able to stay, really take them through what we are looking out of it. So here's a way that you have to measure and calculate around it. Number one, how prepared are you? What's your risk profile? What's your inherent risk? What's coming on a consistent basis? What are you doing to reduce that risk from a visibility perspective? How many controls do you have? Are they effective? The only safe computer, ladies and gentlemen, is the one that you buy and bury. Buy a brand new, beautiful Mac machine, HP, go home, dig a hole, put it in the hole, cover it up. That computer is safe. It's useless too, isn't it? If it means then there's no 100% safety, you have to improve your detection capability. You have to detect what's coming at you. And then finally, this is the numbers, the story that those guys who signed the check want to understand what's the dollar value of what you're protecting. If the asset is worth 100 shillings, why would I spend 10,000 shillings to protect it? You need to be able to speak that story to let them know. Did I make my 10 minutes? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy your lunch. Thanks a lot. Trust. 
It's what keeps the world moving, makes identities powerful, safe purchases possible, access to data and resources seamless. Enabling trusted experiences for consumers, employees, and citizens makes the world a better place. And that's what Entrust does. Our broad solution suite, deep expertise, and commitment to innovation is unmatched. We strive to ensure that identities, payments, and data are protected in all forms, all use cases, from everyday experiences and connections to the most critical interactions, we ensure people can have trust in their world so that the world never stops. And neither do you. In trust, securing a world in motion. All right, once again, please, can we give another round of applause to Joseph Mathenge from Serianu? Very animated uh, conversation. There are very important points that I think we are all still um, internalizing as we pick up everything that we are getting here today. Now we are going to hand you over now to Sarova Whitesons as we enjoy our lunch for the next, uh, I should think, let's get back by 3 o'clock. We have um, not a very intensive half part of the program, but of course it's a build-up towards the gala night this evening. Remember, collect your tickets at the desk at the front there. And also remember, we have an amazing engagement also happening in Hubilo, which is the virtual platform. You also need to leave your business cards for your opportunity to get certified for a class courtesy of African e-development. And also, the most active engagement on Twitter could earn you two nights at uh, Sarova Leon Hill, that is courtesy of Sarova, and also earning points on the virtual platform, you might also get a chance to get two nights at the Sarova Woodlands Resort uh, Hotel in Nakuru. So have a good lunch and see you back at 3 p.m. Asante Nisana.
Surprise my girl because I know she waiting. I open the front door, I hear moaning. For real, somebody, I'm finna kill somebody. Then I get closer, I hear groaning. Bust in the door and see my girl with a chick. That's when I know that my girl got a best friend. I just find her butt inside. Cause I like her best friend too. My girl got a best friend. It really is not a problem. Cause I'ma make it do what it do. Cause having two friends is better than no friends. We all can just be friends. Keep my girl and keep her best friend. My girl got a best friend. It really is not a problem. Cause I'ma make it do what it do. You know you're wrong, Charlie. Could've told me. Tell me about your best friend. How the hell you gon' be with me? Better, Charlie. You so stingy. Girl, you must think I'm stupid. You know exactly how to call out the back. Girl, but I'm so cool. Go call your best friend and watch what I do. Girl, I'm a fool. I'm a fool. So slide over for this child and let me show you how a player get down.
you can tell me go to hell if you like. Uh, nah, I ain't one of them niggas that wanna trip. Get mad cause you ain't interested in yelling, fuck you bitch. Now don't get it twisted, yeah, I'ma look when you pass. But I ain't the one to pull on your arm or grab your ass. You see it's my swagger, he won't allow me looking thirst. And I ain't attacking unless I get a signal first. And I ain't the one that's gonna be paying the dude to do before it's over. You gon' say, she you should pay me. Please believe
I'll give it to you. As long as you want, you know I got it. Called each other nickname and sugar plum and blue beer. I'm always on the road, hardly ever home. I was busy this, busy that, can't talk on the phone. I know you aggravated, walk around frustrated. Patience getting short, how longer can you tolerate it? Listen, mom, I'm just motivated. I do this for us, up on the grind, trying to elevate it. Hey, you gotta really be honest, you stuck with me through my whole struggle. Can't even express the words how much the kid loves you. I'ma stand as a man, never above you. I could tell that you different from most, slightly opposed. You and the ill shit about it, we don't sex every day. But when we sex, we tease in a passionate way. Love the way you touch it, a little elaborate ways. Got the guard feeling released to relax for the day. It's on you, Baby, if you give it to me, I'll give it to you. I know what you want, you know I got it. Baby, if you give it to me, I'll give it to you. As long as you want, you know I got it. Baby, I ain't even frontin', baby, I could take a summer yeah. off, I could break a woman yeah. off, I could take the stomach yeah. off, one of my trucks, now I'm riding in the goods, oh. line it on up, guarantee you get served, yeah. little Chris say run it, so I run into her, I'm that cash money young and Birdman Jr., just a president, looking for a mind of
little look, but she my better half.